What's the hottest news in the Xbox universe right this second? We're gonna tell you. Who thought the Duke controller needed a comeback? We're gonna find out because Seamus Blackley is here. What questions do you, the community, have about Sea of Thieves, Game Pass, and Larry's choice of wardrobe? We'll find out. And I'm giving away all of this to you. You're welcome. And we have everything Sea of Thieves. This is Inside Xbox. Hi, I'm Larry here from Xbox Live's Major Nelson, alongside Graham Boyd, Jeff Rubenstein, Alex Bear, and Rakari Austin. We are thrilled to welcome you to the first episode of Inside Xbox. That's right, Larry. Inside Xbox is back! And this all-new Inside Xbox is a live monthly show that packages up all the freshest Xbox news and delivers it to you hot and steaming. And this month, splice your main braces because we'll be celebrating the upcoming release of Sea of Thieves with unprecedented access to developer Rare. We've also got an exclusive early look at the Xbox Spring update, an update you won't want to miss on Xbox Game Pass, a preview of long-awaited sandbox survival game Pixar, and to top it all off, a special Sea of Thieves quest with a prize that is pure gold. And we will be celebrating great games with you, the community. Rakari and Alex will be standing by over there at the social desk with their fine feathered friends <laughs> with some of your great comments, pictures, and videos throughout the show. So talk to us. Use hashtag InsideXbox on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And of course, keep the conversation flowing on Mixer as well. They're also gonna be leading the charge on our giveaways. Rukari and Alex, not the, not the macaws. Uh, so they're gonna be your besties on this show. Today's uh, show, they're tr the treasure galleon of this show. Yeah. Uh, we have so much content, it's bursting at the seams. And actually, speaking of galleons, you just got back from Rare, didn't you? I did, I had the chance to go up to Rare a few weeks ago and spend some time with the team. My first time out there, Graham, I know you spent a lot of time out there. This, I've been around the world at different game developers, and this is one of the most beautiful oh. Settings, it's gorgeous, isn't it? Um, one of those amazing campuses. In fact, these this is the right team to be making a pirate game. They're making the right game, surprisingly, in the right place. They're not on the ocean, but look at this office. It actually, they look like ships. Yeah, it's 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 something to behold, and I'm looking forward. You'll see more of that coming up later in the show. And also later in the show, we're going to be talking with the PUBG team. We're talking chicken dinners. Yep. I hope the Oosh. parrots don't <laughs> understand us. You guys even think of that. Hey, <laughs> 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 Oh, Jesus. Oh. <laughs> did not like that. We're going to be talking about where PUBG started oh, in game preview, where it is now, and of course, most importantly, what's up next for the game? Yeah, lots of cool stuff to come up in PUBG. Now, we'll also be talking about one of my favorite subjects, Xbox Game Pass, and what's coming up in April. I'll be able to tease some of the stuff that's happening, and there's one game that I'm going to be able to reveal. I'm not going to do it now, but I'll give you a little clue. Yeah. Let's just say that my excitement is building. Oh, you just love puns. Okay, for those of you <laughs> who want puns, Graham's your man. I need a ticker. <laughs> I, on the other hand, will be debuting some new features coming to your Xbox One very soon, and I'm really excited. We're going to demo one right here on this show. How's live? that sound? Live! Great. Right, yeah, we're going to do, do it live. Do it. I also had the chance to talk to Greg Burke uh, about Far Cry 5. He is this guy right here. He's the new... Pagan men. I'm very excited to see how he's going to be able to follow up Troy Baker, who did just such a great job in Far Cry 4, and even uh, Voss from Far Cry 3. They do really, really great good enemies. And i got to tell you this, Far Cry 5 looks amazing on Xbox so One X. And mm. uh, don't forget, if you're watching on mixer.com forward slash Xbox, you'll be eligible to grab some bounteous booty for Sea of Thieves and godlike goodies for Smite. Thanks to our mix pot. I love a Who good doesn't? mix pot, me. <laughs> so to be eligible, make sure you're watching on Mixer and that you're signed into your Microsoft account. That's all you need to do, and then you win. All right, we are smack dab in the middle of the Sea of Thieves final beta, so we appreciate it that you dropped anchor for a little bit and joined us, but there is no shortage of great content being shared by the community right now. Alex and Rakari, what are you guys seeing? Well, it's pretty simple, right? Screenshots. Lots and lots and lots of screenshots. Look, I said it twice and I didn't mess it up. Here we go. We are on a roll. So I'm going to pick a few of my favorites, and that's right. kind of going to be the gist of this whole thing, right? I, you don't know this about me, but on my Xbox profile, I'm a, I'm a big sunset person. Yeah, Love long know. walks on the beach. So one of my favorites off the bat, and I'm going to just pull this one up here. 
Number one Thea of C's fan. Look at that. That's, a, that's that literally what it says. Oh, and I can do that. Oh, I practiced. Yeah. Ooh, look a, out for your boy. That is a stunning photo. So first of all, it's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, we've all talked about it a million times over. See if these is a beautiful right. game. And right, Larry, stop, I know stop. where you're We're going. I know where right you're going. Now. We're going to talk about it this. later. But this game has the finest water I've ever seen in a video game. I mean, it's it is extraordinary. You actually will get. You could get seasick. Warning. Best ever. On Best the, ever. On, yeah, the, the on the prow of yeah. the boat during yeah. a storm? Absolutely. Yep. Put a stamp on it. Larry loves the water. All right. <laughs> <laughs> my, my next one here, and this is from Steph here. Again, I, I love the beach. You know, every time that I play CFD, it's my favorite thing kind of to do. And Jeff, you talk about having no HUD. You get into the world and you see your, the, your ship that's off to the side there, but really you just get to admire the beauty. Yeah, unless you've taken a little bit of damage or you're in battle, you don't see any HUD. And so it's yeah. just you, the surf, your ship. Also, you don't want Rakari in your crew. Obviously, he's not doing any kind of ship work anytime soon. You're like, where's Rakari? Like, are you not repairing anything? All right. Well, I've got a couple of more to pick here. And you know what? I, I like the sunsets in Sea of Thieves as well. This sure. is right before getting like about. blasted in the back oh, by, yeah, this by is, a skeleton. This is where I'm looking, you know, peering off into the, the void, not paying attention to what's going on behind yeah, me. Probably not why patching I love your ship. Sea of Thieves, right? For me, it's like going on a little holiday. You know, yeah. as long as things are peaceful, it's like having a nice seaside break. You can yeah, relax with sharks on the beach. and people Skeletons stealing your boat. Well, right. you know, those are details. I mean, it only gets two, two stars those those and TripAdvisor, but you know. <laughs> and then just one more here. Again, Larry, you touch on the water, and I'm just going to pull it up one more time because it is absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful. Absolutely. And we know people are enjoying that right now at home during during the final beta. Absolutely. Yeah. Going on this weekend. This is amazing. Jamie. Thanks, everybody, for playing along. And we really appreciate all of you at home sending us things with the hashtag InsideXbox. I just picked five at random. Those of you who, uh, with that handle on the screen right now, and all of you are going to get those Sea of Thieves game, Whoa. along with one month subscription to Xbox Game Pass. Yay. So keep sending in your comments, your questions, your images, and videos all along the show using the hashtag Inside Xbox. Plus, thanks to our friends at Mixer, everyone logged into Mixer with their Microsoft account is going to receive some cool in-game items via Mixpot. First up, you're going to get a stylish black and silver even flintlock to what? aid you nice. on the open wow. waters in Sea of Thieves. That's gorgeous, right? I need that. need that in my life. Mixpot is also doling out some love for Smite with the Stargazer Anubis skin. You'll score the skin and access to the Anubis character and voice pack. And did I mention that all of this is free and all you need to do is log into Mixer and you'll automatically get these in-game items. Keep in mind, though, the flintlock does not unlock until Sea of Thieves comes out on March 20th. Right? Can't get it early. So close, but so far. So close. Can't wait. Okay, right. So recently, Larry set sail for Rare in my homeland of the UK, but he didn't invite me. He proceeded to hang out with all of my favorite people to get the skinny of all things Sea of Thieves. He didn't even bring me any item brew back. Oh, I forgot Thanks about that. Thanks a lot, Larry. I don't I'm even know what that is. I'm not bitter at all. <laughs> <laughs> now, Larry's travels included this chat with studio head Craig Duncan and executive producer Joe Neat to find out what makes Sea of Thieves tick and what separates the golden age of piracy from any other game. Let's take a look. Lydia and I are here at Rare with Craig and Joe. We're excited to talk about Sea of Thieves, right guys? Absolutely. So let's start from the beginning. Fans who are totally new to Sea of Thieves, how would you describe it? How would you sum up that magic? It's the ultimate pirate game. Yeah. Is that, that that's a description? Um, <laughs> but I mean, our vision is is really about players going on adventures together. Like Sea of Thieves is a cooperative adventure game in a pirate universe. It's about creativity and imagination and coming into this world. And you can look at Sea of Thieves and decide what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And you can come into it and you can kind of live that out, right? It's like live the pirate life. It's the pirate game you've always wanted is kind of how we've always talked about it. We saw that, uh, the, the tremendous excitement in the beta earlier this year. And yeah. you guys must have learned a lot from that. I think what makes Sea of Thieves so compelling is you never really know how players are going to do, what kind of crew they're going to form. When they see that ship on the horizon, are they going to go and try and seek it out? Mm -hmm. Are they going to go and make friends with people? Are they going to ignore them and or lead them into a storm to the rocks and their doom? Like it's, it's just all of those magical adventures that, that you never really know what players are going to do. So was there any behavior uh, from players that really surprised you? 
you know, we had this fun one where two ships passed each other. We were watching the stream and one of them got up on the bow and he's emoting. So he's waving as the other ship goes by. And you could see the other ship and just as they passed each other, it was like, okay, one cannon shot from either of these two ships and all hell's gonna break loose. And it didn't, they kind of passed, they waved at each other and they both went about their journey. And it's that kind of stuff that there's no game like Sea of Thieves. Mm. You talked about teams and people meeting up and, and kind of creating these groups online. I saw a little bit of that earlier this year where there was groups that were claiming they got one, two, three, four ships together and were, were trolling through the entire universe as an armada. That was kind of unexpected, wasn't it? Yeah, well I think people go, can I do this, can I do that? Can we form alliances? Is there a mechanic for that? And it's like, there's not a mechanic, there's a game for it. Right. right. There's <laughs> so, a social yeah. contract, that, yeah. to your point, Craig, where we're gonna go by each other and you're gonna, not gonna fire, I'm not gonna fire, we're white flag. Right, so or play music. Right, yeah. that, that's, that seems to be a universal sign of yeah, yeah, friendship yeah, yeah. and yeah, yeah. peace. Yeah, and honestly, our vision for the start of this, before even pirates, was players creating stories together. That right. was the phrase. That was the, the the name of our original like unromantic black and white PowerPoint deck. Right, but it was all about that. And so now, when you're seeing players out there. They are having these stories and creating these stories together. And that was just a story you talked about, what Craig talked about. These are all moments and memories for, for all of our players. It's so much fun to, to either read about it or hear about it or watch it as much as it is to play. And those kind of things feed each other because you watch people playing and you're like, oh, now I want to go in and what can I do in that world? It kind of sparks your imagination, your creativity. I want to talk a little bit about the world. You, you created this lush, beautiful world that people are just having a ball in. But it's a little bit different because you're dropped into this world. You have a crew of two, three, four people. You don't have this really like this big video game marker that says go that direction to do this thing. People kind of have to figure it out together, right? That's, oh, yeah. that's part of the fun. Yeah. I think it encourages play. And and actually, the thing we all do as kids, which is we go into the woods and we make a, we make a fort. I nearly call it a skelly fort. <laughs> we've been talking about skelly forts. But, like, you know, how, how do you play? What do you do? Like, just, just these moments of, like, let's go create fun. Let's go have an adventure together. We believe in the magic of multiplayer. We believe in the magic of players being together and deciding what their goal is going to be. And that goal might be to go take out that ship or it might be to ignore it and go find some more treasure. The magic is there's always other crews or other people on their own adventures in the world. Our game is uniquely social and has been designed yeah. to encourage positive social interactions and there, there are features in there that make you smile, they make you laugh. And when you do that, you kind of make friends, like, mm -hmm. you know, all accidentally, right? And, um, and, and it's, all, it's all been designed to do that. So like, try it, play with others and you'll see that this is like nothing you've played before. We believe so strongly in the power of social play and, and multiplayer. You can come in to see a Thieves and make new friends. To have that as like one of our goals for the project and to see it been playing out throughout the alpha. Yeah. That like makes me warm and warm and <laughs> mushy warm and inside, and yeah. Explain to us what hideouts are and how they work in the game. Cool. Ultimately your kind of quest to become a pirate legend and the goal for this is is gaining access to the pirate hideout, which is a, a place exclusively for pirate legends. Mm -hmm. Although if you're with a pirate legend you, they can take you in there. And it's a place in the world we, we haven't revealed where and, oh, right. and we haven't revealed how to kind of yep. how access. to find it, how to gain access to it. That's a mystery we want our players to uncover. Okay. It's a place where there's some NPCs, some ghostly NPCs that will give you access to kind of different quests and goals and it's really the jumping off point for the golden age of piracy that's yet to come in yeah. Sea of Thieves. When you get that ship captaincy that we talked about like coming in as part of the service that will be accessible from this pirate hideout. So yeah it's kind of an exclusive club for pirates. Well I'm sure that we're going to hear many many stories about this. We're just just about at launch so I want to congratulate you guys on this far. You got a lot of work to go, a lot of work to do but I know that based on what you just told us the community is going to be part of that. Yeah. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks guys. Uh, it's been great. We're just moments away from Major Nelson sitting down with Rare Studio head Craig Duncan and Sea of Thieves executive producer Joe Neat. But first, it has been a huge month for Xbox Game Pass. That's right, mate. So releasing just this month has been Rise of the Tomb Raider. That's a biggie. I know, it's a cracker. I think it might be one of the biggest games we've had on Xbox Game Pass so far. So, And it sort of ticks all the boxes. Yep. Xbox One X Enhanced, Xbox Play Anywhere. So it's a game that you can play on Xbox One or Windows 10. That's right. And of course, it looks phenomenal if you've got the rig to do it there too. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the saves, of course, port back and forth. Nice. Uh, and, and possibly one of the best looking Xbox One X Enhanced games out there, I think. I mean, this thing looks, it looked incredible first time around. 
looks even better now. And do you know what? The movie's out this week. That's right. So good timing from that point of view. And I've got to be honest, I never got to the end of Rise of the Tomb Raider. The, time around, it's so. really good. I'm on my second playthrough, and this is a game that you really can spend a lot of... I'm, I spent too much time trying to shoot a chicken out of the air with a bow and arrow for an achievement. <laughs> for an achievement, but yeah. I, I think I did do that for oh, you. Oh, no, no, you're, you're at least the on the important stuff. But uh, yeah, you know, great reason to get into Xbox Game Pass is that it, it gives you a chance to catch up on those games that are on your pile of shame. You know, you can get back into them and, and experience them again. So that's fantastic. Uh, next up is Super. For Lucky's Tale, again, like a really recent title, uh, came out last year, also Xbox One X enhanced, and it's a ton of fun as well. I've been playing it with my kids, and look at this, you know, there's Lucky himself, bright, colorful, lots of platforming action. It's a cracker. Yeah, this is another Xbox Play Anywhere game. I've been spending a lot of time with this on, on my laptop, and I'm just trying to get those last few clovers so I can get to the end game. I'm nice. very close. It's a nice, nice palate cleanser, this one. Someone tweeted me about this the other day, that, you know, been playing a lot of first-person shooters or racing games or whatever, jump into Super Lucky's Tale, get a total change of pace. And, and while it may look simplistic, this again is definitely kid friendly. When you get into those later levels, they are not messing around. Totally. There's some really challenging platforming. Yeah, there's proper hardcore platforming in there as well as all the fun as well. Now, next one up is uh, one of your personal favorites, yeah. right? So I'm going to leave this one to you, Oxenfree. Oxenfree, one of my favorite games in the sort of like uh, narrative uh, sort of genre. No game has handled conversations. No game ever has handled conversations better than this game. Amazing voice acting. Very creepy. If you're into Stranger Things or X-Files, not over horror, but like really creeped out type of mm. stuff and the supernatural. This is a fantastic game. Only takes maybe eight, 10 hours to beat and I might have one K'd this one as well. Nice. So uh, don't let this one pass you It does by. great stuff with sound, doesn't it? And as well, and yep. I love the way you can cut into people's conversations. Exactly. You don't have to wait for them to finish what they're saying. It's really, it's super natural the way they do that one. <laughs> I, I'm sorry for wow. that dad. I've been hanging out with you too much. I know, I'm sorry about that, it's rubbing off. All right, else, uh, what else do we have? We've got Resident Evil Revelations 2. We've got Sonic CD, The Final Station, and last but certainly not least, Euro fishing. Two you know of my favorite things. Yeah, you know all about this one. Tell us about Euro fishing. Uh, honestly, I don't know a ton. Uh, I haven't played it, but it's an Xbox Game Pass, so it's a great reason to get in there and give it a shot. But I did spend some time with the, the development team last year in the UK. They're called Dovetail Games, mm -hmm. and they are so passionate about these simulators that they make. They're also making Train Simulator World. Which Just came out, I think, yesterday. Yeah. So, and the communities around these games are humongous. So if you fancy a bit of you know, relaxed Euro fishing, Xbox Game Pass. And if it's if you're not sure you're into Euro fishing, well, Xbox Game Pass is a great way to just give it a shot. And 100%. maybe maybe it really, you know, It's another great you. reason for to have Xbox Game Pass. What kind of fish Pass, do they right? have out there? I maybe I want to know. Oh, just all the fish. Um, they've all got accents. That's what makes them European. <laughs> yeah, um, just, thank you. But, but the biggest story in March is undoubtedly the addition of Sea of Thieves yes, to Xbox Game Pass. that's right. Earlier this year, we announced that all new Xbox One exclusive titles from Microsoft Studios will enter Xbox Game Pass when they launch. No waiting, immediate access to games like Sea of Thieves, State of Decay 2, and Crackdown 3 right on launch day. That's, uh, that's that? pretty good, yeah. And of course, Sea of Thieves out in 10 days time from now. Uh, I absolutely love Games Pass, right? It's like getting instant access to a whole new game collection, right? I always think of this, it's like, it's like getting keys to the sweetie shop or the candy shop for you guys and being able to eat whatever you want without ever getting a tummy ache. Were you, were you deprived of candy as a child? I was actually. Yeah, yeah. Trying to make up for it. Well, I'm glad we're getting with it. Well, I've got to be careful. Uh, and I'll tell you what, it's a great way to boost your gamer score as well. Like I'm that on a gamer is. score challenge this year and Xbox Game Pass just opens up. Seen a couple websites that are actually spelling out the best ways to run up your gamer score with Game Pass games. So. Nice, send me that email for that. Yeah, I need that link. Uh, but I wanted to tell you what's coming soon to Xbox Game Pass. We, we're like three weeks away from April. Are we allowed to do that? I don't know. Why don't you? But take you know this what, Jeff? One? Let's do it anyway. Uh, so uh, the game. Uh, so let me. We've got eight fresh games coming to uh, Game Pass in April. Uh, I can't tell you all of them, unfortunately. We'll tell you more about some of them later this month. But I can tell you about one, uh, and I can confirm that it's one of the personal favorites of do mine. Tell. It's Cities Skylines. Now, I've been a fan of city building games since I was a wee wee boy, and Skylines is genuinely a love letter to the glory days of the city sim. So it lets you design and construct the urban metropolis or the quaint little community of your choice and offers you a frankly dizzying selection of customization and building options, right? And this game is really addictive, Jeff, let me tell you. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a great game to sit back with, right? Relax, take your time, plan your city, watch it grow up. And cup you know, of tea. Cup of tea. You know I love to, to play a game that lets you drink a nice cup of tea as well, so it's a cracker. Yeah, I actually 
got into this game uh, when the Windows 10 edition came out last year, mm -hmm. and uh, I figured city building game, yep. perfect for mouse and keyboard. Uh, and then very recently, I, I jumped into the Xbox One edition, and I was surprised at how great the controls were. They really adapted. There's a lot of uh, maneuvering in. You can zoom in all the way to the individual person level yeah, totally, in your yeah. city, and using the thumbsticks and, and the triggers to zoom in and out. It's actually very much like a, any third person shooter or, or flight game. I actually really like it with the, the controller. And the other thing that worried me is like, oh, so many options, I'm just gonna get sort of overwhelmed with it. They really bring you along so, uh, in a way and they, they don't overwhelm you with all of those choices and I'm already, I'm already bankrupt. Yeah. Uh, so actually, how about some hints? <laughs> like, how, how do you yeah. make a good city? You're more well-versed as a city planner than Mate, I Mate, I have all the tips for you, right? So tip number one, is take it slow. I messed up there. And watch it grow, right? You know, you can you, you start slow, plan your town out, think about what you want, but don't be afraid to sometimes just sit back. Uh, you can speed the game clock up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, just press And the just left watch what happens. Let people move in, watch your town develop. Put, see in, a, the put in a football stadium are. as soon as you've got 50 people living there. Well, there you go. You I, know, I what kind else of went do you need? Death that way. Um, but don't go out, you know, all guns blazing, spend all your money, first of all, because you need to let you need to let things develop a little bit, right? So that's tip number one. Tip number two, lean on the bank. The game actually offers you really healthy loans to keep your city growing uh, and keep your bank account full as well, right? I think so I missed up on, I missed that one. Yeah. You've got to get into the bank yeah. there. Put on your you, best suit. Get oh, I know, maybe a letter of recommendation. I just want to build a city, please, bank manager. You'll be fine. Uh, but just make sure that you're paying off those loans. Uh, you know, That's where I, I'm good at taking a loan. It's, uh, the, it's the paying off part, yeah. Uh, and third, possibly the most important tip of all, is plan early for traffic, right? Your transport network will make or break your city. And I, I've built a lot of cities and got quite a long way along. And and suddenly it's gridlock. We've already gotten LA. Yeah. Don't build a second <laughs> Exactly, one. yeah. So think ahead about all your travel routes, offer alternatives to car transport. There's loads of different transport um, options in the game, which is really, really cool. Uh, and don't be afraid to demolish areas to put in better roads. I know, you know, you might need to tear down some of those beautiful old houses oh, in your town, but that's progress, Jeff. That was a craftsman, it was beautiful. That's progress, that's how it has to work. Well, speaking of progress, that is not all that April has in store, so stay tuned to news.xbox.com for more details in the weeks ahead. And don't forget that Xbox Game Pass has a quest every month where you can participate to win prizes just by playing Xbox Game Pass games. That's right. This month's quest is a clash of nations. We are pitting Xbox gamers in the United States, Canada, France, and Germany against each other to see who can compete to win the most, oh, sorry, who can earn the most achievements in Xbox Game Pass titles in March. Now I know what you're thinking. Do you? But don't worry. The country with the biggest population won't necessarily win because everyone who enters has a chance to win, but we'll be counting the average number of achievements earned per participant in each country. Are you still with me, Jeff? Yes. <laughs> Good. With the participants from the winning country receiving extra bonus entries for prizes, right? So think of this like gross domestic product, but for gamer score. You realize I didn't take any economics classes. <laughs> Neither did I but it's all good. Right, It'll and the, be fair. But the, the important thing, right, is the prizes are amazing, and they include the grand prize, which is uh, coming Larry's up bringing here it in. now. Oh my Whoa. God, this is so ridiculous Look and so awesome. This is not plastic, this is not chrome. We're talking a 24 karat gold-plated Project Scorpio Edition Xbox One X. The X Except clearly the stands for oh, extra, hey, don't touch off. that. He's wearing gloves. It's very subtle and classy, isn't it? And Larry, you will, of course, come by once a week to whoever wins to, to dust it off. Dust it off and <laughs> it comes with that. And it does have a matching controller as well. It kind of reminds me a little bit of the C3PO Xbox 360 controller yeah, from back in thing. the day, except it is gold. Oh my God. Actual proper gold. That, uh, and you gotta put that on the mantelpiece if you win that. Oh, 100%. And lovely to see uh, Larry's gloves back again, making another appearance. He puts fingerprints on everything. Yeah, absolutely. All right, don't forget the Xbox Game Pass gets you instant access to over 100 games you can download and play to your heart's content. So that's over 100 games for just $9.99, seven pounds 99, or 9.99 euros. Wow, you are really the economics guy here. For more information on Xbox Game Pass, check out our official site at Xbox. Xbox.com. And don't forget, if you haven't tried it yet, you can unlock Xbox Game Pass, a 14-day free trial. Now, Sea of Thieves is out in 10 days, so that I can handle that math. You should get on it. Ooh, works out perfectly, doesn't it? Now, speaking of Sea of Thieves, 
Earlier, we heard from Craig and Joe from Rare about the heart of the game, which is players telling stories together. Now, of course, fans want to know what pirate adventures await them. So Lydia Ellery asked design director Mike Chapman, and what resulted is perhaps the greatest end-to-end -end monologue about gameplay that I've ever seen. So here's his in uninterrupted answer. Enjoy. You think of like Sea of Thieves as this rich pirate world, and much the same way that players are going to come to the world, we have these trading companies. And these trading companies represent what we believe are the, the, the cool waves of players that we want to have there for launch. So you've got the gold hoarders. And the gold hoarders have come to the Sea of Thieves to treasure hunt. They were here to amass this great fortune. So they allow players to progress and build a reputation by exploring these islands and think of it as light puzzle solving. You're, you're digging up the exact marks of spot, you're solving these priority riddles. And then you've got the Merchant Alliance. The Merchant Alliance have come to control trade in the Sea of Thieves. They see it as a fledgling market. And they will pay pirates a cut of the profit if they ferry these animals around the world. The world of Sea of Thieves is not only filled with wildlife that just looks lovely on the island. It's also an intrinsic part of the gameplay. So you have reward for ferrying chickens of different breeds, of pigs that you need to feed on your ship, snakes that can poison you. So you build a reputation with the Merchant Alliance by finding these rare breeds of animals around the world. And you can imagine the more you play, the more you build your knowledge of where these animals are. And then we have the Order of Souls, and they will pay pirates to become bounty hunters. So they'll send you out there on these quests to go and take down these fearsome skeleton crews and captains. The magic of all of this is that it's all happening in the same world. So you've got pirates of all these different motivations working for these different companies. So one moment you come across a ship and it's doing merchant quests. You hear the chickens kind of crowing in the distance and they go, ah, they must be merchants. You board a ship and you see they've got some treasure chests but they've also got all of these animals. Or they've got the skulls of these captains that they've taken down. All of this coexisting in the same world means that you get all these different variables at play. You get to have those awesome pirate moments of boarding a ship and stealing someone's little pig that they've, <laughs> they've built up this affinity for. Or, or stealing this skull of this fearsome skeleton captain that they've taken taken down. But it's not only that, you've also got this rich world where there's these emergent opportunities. So one moment you could be heading to an island to treasure hunt, and then you head past an island, you see a glint, you look through your spyglass, and it's a message in a bottle. Mm -hmm. So that might take you on a whole different adventure. Or you might be heading around the world and see seagulls on the horizon, and you look through your spyglass and it's wreckage on the water. And there's actually a shipwreck deep below. You dive down, there could be schools in there, there could be more messages in the bottle, there could be other quest rewards. We've also got skeleton forts. And this is where you see this huge looming skeleton cloud on the horizon filled with lightning. And that acts as a beacon to pull players together. And the idea is that the skeleton fort cloud can be seen when a fort is occupied. And when it's occupied, it's filled with skeletons. And also the vault is full of reward for you to go and capture. These clouds act as a beacon for that honeypot that brings players together. You might work together in cooperation to take down the fort, to take down this horde mode style challenge, or you might be in conflict. When you take down the fort, you earn a key that unlocks the vault. And much in the same way as, as our players have seen, the, the key is a physical object like the chests, like the animals, like the skulls, and the key can change hands. So you've got all these kind of cool pirate movie style scenarios of the key changing hands of crews double crossing each other to, to be the one that eventually opens the vault door. I guess the point, and I've forgotten as well, we've got storms. So all of this could be happening where you've got these weather systems moving around the world, these kind of forces of nature that you can lure other crews into, or you've got to sail through yourself to reach these objectives. And then of course, the Kraken. Much in the same way as the storm, the Kraken is a force of nature. You can't predict it, you can't control it. It's something that can strike you while you're out there on these adventures. It's these directed goals through the trading companies, they're the things that give you the steer. You come in there, you've got an hour to spend, you want to make some progress, take on a voyage for the trading companies. But each time you do one of those voyages, it's going to play differently because you find a message in a bottle. You take the advantage of diving down to a shipwreck. You work with another crew to take down a skeleton fort. You get tapped by the Kraken on the way back where your ship is fully laden with treasure. Never plays the same. It's always going to play differently. How you react to those challenges and those opportunities, that's really the magic of Sea of Thieves. All right, well, Alex, you've got new co-hosts, yeah? Yeah. You're replacing me already? Yeah. No, this feels great. Sorry. It feels great. Thanks a bunch. I appreciate it. I mean, they're they're, they're prettier. Okay, we're good? All yeah, right. You guys are I was going to high five, but like, all right. <laughs>
Well, we've just heard about players telling stories together in Sea of Thieves. Let's take a look at what the community has been up to. So you know what's the beautiful part about this? We get to pick some of our favorite clips. And you know what? I'm jumping right into this one. I'm jumping right into this oh, one. Oh, God. Don't this look. This one's from Steph. Don't look. It's not what it seems like. <laughs> well, what's going on in this one? So, Shh, just look away. I mean, we can read the tweet out to you. We're Graphics of Sea of Thieves are absolutely checked. And you Don't can see it on me. screen here. The cats are going at it. Don't tell They're, the birds that, again. Don't tell the birds. Look at her eyes. Oh, she's, Shut up. Hey, okay, she's go to been, next one. She's been eyeing go to the next entire one. time. Well, that is one down. <laughs> and all of you logged in at home uh, on Mixer are getting some free in-game items today. But I'm feeling very generous. So for sending this clip that we were just watching here, Stefan, we're going to give you a limited edition Sea of Thieves controller. Marvel at its laser <laughs> etched barnacle and treasured golden trigger. Plus... It includes an in-game ferryman clothing set. Look at Larry over there, first of all, with the white gloves on, doing his, his best Vanna impersonation. Wonderful I, stuff, I wonderful have, stuff. I don't have words. Now, these <laughs> things are sold out in the United States and are hotter than buried treasure. I feel like that's a gram line, but we're going to roll with it anyway. All right, so next <laughs> clip is up. Let's do it. We're going to pick here. I saw this one earlier, and I quite enjoyed it. So this one's from Barney, and what's happening here is... Little to no effort in order to get that tre or that chest, that you know, that coveted chest. Sneaks up on somebody who's digging up this treasure chest, has done oh. all the work to find it, and loots it. I mean, Thank I guess you. that's the pirate life, right? Yeah, right. That's the pirate life. Lazy that's absolute... pirate life. I mean, I feel like there's some pirates that maybe. Uh, lazy harder. but efficient. Lazy but efficient. Okay. Work smarter. I don't even not know sure how those all two right. words go together. Well, Next. Barney, <laughs> we're going to reward you for your contribution to Inside Xbox with a Sea of Thieves portable hard drive. This will be released with the game on March 20th. It's a two terabyte hard drive and it includes one month of Xbox Game Pass, an exclusive jewel studded in-game weapon. Larry, one more time, look at how oh, beautiful. Oh, Absolutely gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> All right, well, we've got one more to pick from here and you know, I watched this one earlier and it's absolutely my favorite. And it's simple. It's very simple yet effective, but it's what you try and do when you get into a game like Sea of Thieves and you've got all the time to world and to explore and check things out. Loads himself into the cannon, shoots up to what's possibly one of the best vantage points in the game. It's amazing. I just want to see if you can, you know, if you can pick off other pirates from that distance. So Zet, you know what? You win a Sea of Thieves Xbox bundle that includes an Xbox One S that's Sea of Thieves game and one month of Xbox Live Gold. This treasure also releases day and date with the game on March 20th. Larry, again, one more time. You, you're doing wonderfully clear, over there. I'm you're sorry. doing wonderfully. We, we have to keep the gloves. All right, well, get <laughs> ready to colonize the Red Planet. Space Sim Game Surviving Mars comes out next week. So let's take a look at the latest trailer. Elon Musk, hope you're taking note. Good morning, beautiful Red Planet. It's time to rise and shine. This is Radio One Mars, wishing all of you a great day at work. We've got the weather report coming up in a little bit. But first, the morning news. The construction of our new dome, designed by our best engineers and scientists, is nearly finished. Rumors say that it will house a restaurant, a bar, and a casino. As you might have noticed, a passenger rocket from Earth arrived early this morning, bringing new, brave pioneers to our planet. In the Agriculture Dome, the new water reclamation system has proven to be very effective. First reports say that up to 70% of the dome's H2O can be recycled. Due to last week's meteor storm and the resulting damage to our colony, the installation of new MDS defense lasers has been fast-tracked. Yesterday, two additional cargo shuttles were taken into service. These units will help to satisfy the growing demand for resources at the northern outskirts of our colony. Now, it's time for the weather report. We have indications that major dust devils are building up in Sector A7. Oh, oh hold on. What's this? I, I don't understand.
there you go, folks. Surviving Mars, that looks great, doesn't it? But let me, can I just say, I cannot get enough of Larry and the gloves. It's like my favorite thing. Quiet Larry is my favorite. Yeah, he's like a mime on there, wasn't he, it? I do, he's really? got a lot of range. <laughs> All right, we'll be heading back to the high seas in just a moment. But first, Mixer has had themselves quite a month, Jeff, eh? Yeah, part of the work that I do here at Microsoft is working with content creators every mm -hmm. day. So it was really good to see Mixer introduce uh, direct purchase. This is something that's uh, currently rolling out to select partners, but ultimately, a, a lot of folks, they decide what they're gonna be playing next by watching creators. Are they oh, enjoying yeah. the game? Do they wanna play with them? So this feature allows, if you're watching a game, you're watching uh, creators and they're playing something you're into, you can actually, if they select this uh, on Xbox One or Windows 10, you can go ahead and purchase direct directly from the stream. Nice. So you get the game, it goes into your download queue, your favorite creator, they get a little something, something. Everybody seems to win. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I love this as well because for developers, I think there's a great opportunity here as well. Like, so many games recently have become massive because of streamers playing them, getting them out to a big audience. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, this is pretty a much everything. Right? Yeah, yeah, including Sea of Thieves, which I know a lot of people are streaming right now. There you go, right this very second. Yeah. I hope they're also watching this as well, though. Uh, they can multitask. Um, picture in picture they, or something. They, I think they've got. Um, now, Mixer also introduced a brand new Hype Zone channel recently. Now, I know you know what Hype Zone is, right? If you at home haven't seen Hype Zone before, this is ace, right? Basically, it's a non-stop highlight reel of amazing gaming moments from like, you know, those really important moments in a game, right? Yeah, so when the you're, PUBG hype yeah, zone you're down right? to like three or four uh, players left and it's all live. It's not like cool. pre-recorded highlights. You get to see people when like the game is getting its most intense. Exactly. So you're getting all those moments where there could be a chicken dinner. Yes. But actually, sometimes it's, so it's even the, more entertaining the, the, the if there's not a Parents are here. Let's just, oh, you know, yes, earmuffs. Sorry. God, yeah, someone cover their ears. Um, now, so the PUBG Hype Zone channel already exists, and we recently added the Fortnite Hype Zone channel as well. So I know Fortnite is like the, world, the game that the world's going crazy for just now. If you head over to the Fortnite Hype Zone channel, you'll be able to watch, as I say, non-stop clips live from around the world of real streamers really streaming as they get down to those victory royales as well. It's so. pretty crazy, like having luckily managed, I was streaming one time, gotten to the top five, oh, I think yeah. duos with Larry, nice. and immediately all the comments on, on the feed is like, yes. you're, you're in the hype zone, you're in the hype zone, and then immediately we got killed because I freaked out. Well, that's it, I love yeah. watching it, and you see, you can actually see it happen to streamers' faces yeah. when they realize they're in the hype zone, and it's that extra stress and like pressure that comes upon people people when they're in there like oh so a lot of people freeze and but that's you know that's all part, part of the of fun, the fun. Exactly. it is all part of the fun it's a great way for discovering new streamers as well mm -hmm. right as i say these are real streamers streaming in real time all around the world so when you're watching it you can discover people that you would never normally have discovered before and there you go you might find your new favorite mixer streamer exactly so hype zone you can find it pretty easily at mixer.com and mixer has also announced that they are the exclusive new home for smite pro league and the smite console series the kickoff for the Smite Pro League begins on March 20th, busy day that one, <laughs> with Rival and NRG doing battle in the fast-paced third-person action MOBA. And for all the detail on Mixer's coverage of for Smite, uh, check out the blog at Mixer.com. Yeah, that's right. All right, let's, let's go back to Sea of Thieves. Yeah. Discovery is, is what Sea of Thieves is all about. And we're not just talking about going from island to island and, and finding treasures, you actually discover how the game itself works and like, like how to fight, how to sail, how to fight, how to navigate the seas, uh, the, like how to even shoot yourself from a cannon. It's actually really fun <laughs> watching it's people the first time. That, yeah, yeah, even it? just lifting the sail because you, you're dropped in there and there's just that sense of discovery and it's actually really fun to watch other people do that as well. Creating natural design like that though is, is actually a tricky business. So Major Nelson and Lydia dug into this approach with lead designer Shelley Preston and art director Ryan Stevenson. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Joe Neat. He's the executive producer for Sea of Thieves, and the man can make up some pirate names, trust me. Uh, it's going to be a live interview from Satellite, from Rare in the UK, to check in on the final beta and discuss what changes are afoot based on player feedback. Let's take a look. Hey guys, Lydia here with Major Nelson and we are joined by Ryan and Shelley from the Sea of Thieves team and we're going to be chatting about all things design. Very excited to talk to you guys because I've played a lot of the game, we both have, and there's a lot of interesting touches in the game that people may not realize that are subtle. The game gets out of the way and kind of teaches you. I want to talk about your design and approach and your, your ethos to, to Sea of Thieves. 
With Sea of Thieves, wherever possible, we didn't want to have um, HUD and UI elements on the screen. We wanted you to be really immersed in this world. And we saw it as a real opportunity that we could just teach you through natural kind of audio visual feedback, yeah. just teach you how, especially things like how the ship works. You just feel like you're learning that naturally, like the ship is this real mechanical thing that you're learning how to sail. Yeah. So we wanted to keep all the feedback like just natural and in world so that you're just immersed. And instead of looking at little indicators on the screen, you're just in the world. And the crew that you're with is a really important part of that. Bringing you together and trying to think of ways to kind of naturally have you cooperate and need to communicate together was a part of that so the reason why we split the map up from the person on the wheel is so that you kind of need to cooperate together and to communicate and I think well, the way that everything works naturally kind of helps with that bringing you all together because you kind of need everybody having their little part in the adventure and the real world as well it makes it feel yeah. like a, a world where if you're just pulling up menus to, to kind of look at yeah. things rather than an actual physical map it, it kind of gets in the way of that experience mm -hmm. where when you're you're using a lantern you're using the compass you're looking at the map and looking at the wind it makes you feel like this is a world that ticks in the sense that's exactly what yeah. we, we wanted to see, you to believe you're there in Sea of Thieves you know that's the, the lack of hood on screen you're just you're really there you're in this world you're acting how you you would expect to act you know if you're lost on an island and your crew's trying to find you they don't look on a mini map to see a marker of where you are you get your compass out and go oh, i'm to the west or you say i can see the sun yeah. setting behind me and you just use natural in world ways like you would in real life right. yeah and i think a great example of that is this, when you look up and you see the direction of the wind yes. i mean clearly everyone yeah. knows okay the wind's going that way yeah. i guess i gotta have my sail so that i can turn it around and, and enjoy the the, the breeze to my back to get where I want to go, right? Yeah, exactly. So the more you turn your sails, the more wind you're catching in the sail, the faster you're yeah. going. Even the amount, it billows as well. Yes. So the final billow yeah. when you're really catching. There's kind of a neat snap, snap to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it? kind of boom. We exaggerated that. We wanted that to really pop. So you you get that feedback that right, it's in the perfect, you're in the sweet spot. So you talked about sort of you know exploration and discovering things for yourself. Obviously, with an open world game having this, this mass, you know, advanced sea to explore. How did you deal with kind of getting to the end of you know end of the map, if you will? Uh, That's one of my favourite things yeah. actually. The idea was to create this kind of impenetrable fog around the outside of the world, which was the uh, nickname the Devil Shroud. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it is this um, really disruptive kind of sea that's, that's poisonous. So we, we made it visually like it was like it was dangerous to be in, and, and then the design came in with the whole way it starts damaging the ship. Yeah, as well. like it, we wanted, like you said, just a mm. natural. Like you, you might sail off the edge of the world and. You kind of surprised are like why is the why is the sky turning yeah. like what's happening and then happened, you yeah. can hear like the ship is under strain the audio team did an awesome job with that it really feels like your ship is getting it's punished crumbling. it's crumbling yeah. and then you start taking all this damage and then very quickly you learn like oh, okay that's what happens when i sail off off the edge of the map there's a couple of other things i noticed like when what you're doing some of the game mechanics to bring players together the 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 skull over the island that's a very subtle thing but i mean everyone will look up and see this go if something's going on there let's go exactly. right and that's yeah. that's really powerful yeah that's exactly what yeah. it was designed for is so that you can see it from really far away and you can make that decision, do we want to go there? Because, of course, you know that everyone else can see it as well, so it's a dangerous place to be, but there's great rewards to be had if you go and take down the skeleton fort. The original idea for it as well was quite interesting in the sense that we knew we wanted to have a skull island, but we didn't want to do the traditional kind of like rock skull on an island and you sure. just go around and go, there you go, that's what it is. So it was born out of the idea of having billows of smoke coming out of an island and forming that skull cloud. So we actually had that quite early on, this visual that we thought was really interesting. And then as soon as the skelly forts appeared and we had the idea of bringing people together, the school fort kind of just kind of fit. Yeah, because it kind of hovers above in yeah. this very foreboding fashion mm. that's, in some ways, it's beckoning you. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, <laughs> beckoning you for death. <laughs> <laughs> So as a designer uh, working with art and, and visuals, what was it like the working art director? Art director. <laughs> Sorry for the correction. Yeah, the art director. Um, it was the fact that there was so much um, freedom in the sense of that the, the design is paired back in the sense of the way that it, it's not about menus, it's not about overly mechanical kind of like systems. It's, it's lots of these little touches. And so with the artwork, it was all about creating a believable world. So everything feels real to you when you're going around the world and also the way you interact with it all. And we were able to put really history into every single item. So from the compass that you hold in your hand with a cracked lens to the telescopes that feel battered, we were trying to get lore and story into every single item. And by the design being quite light in some of the way that it, it in, interacted with them, we were able to really make the most of it. We are 
60 or 70 miles from the, from the ocean. <laughs> How in a landlocked space like out here in Rare did you guys do such an excellent job? You tell me about the research you did to capture so accurately what it's like to be on the ocean and to be a pirate. I've watched a lot of films. <laughs> I think I've watched virtually every single pirate film there is right. ever, even the bad ones, yeah. all, all, all the bad ones. But yeah, we also went to the Golden Hind down in London, yeah. which is um, and a, a cutty shark as well, yeah, yeah, isn't it? We went shark. to like a big ship and a really little ship where we were all hitting our heads on the on the ceiling. It's about that almost playing as a, as a kid and your imagination and your version of what being pirates and being out on that ocean is. And so there's a simplification of that as well to kind of just- But it's, it. it's the quintess, I mean, I've played so much of it and it's so wonderful. It is like the quintess essential pirate experience when you were a kid, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's it's the mind's eye, perfect, beautiful version yeah. of being a pirate. I think everyone has their idea of what that is and everyone's got their different inspiration for that of Pirates of the Caribbean yeah. or like, I love the Gooners and everyone's got their own version of where that comes from but then you've got a team of like 100 plus people all with that idea and everybody's bringing their own version of that and I yeah. think I think that's why it's such a powerful thing because everybody knows pirates. And we embraced all the tropes. We just yeah. kind of looked at all yeah. the classic pirate things and just went, we've got to do this. Yeah, we, we right. literally have got a children's book that's like 101 <laughs> like pirate ideas and we joke that this is that's our design document it's yeah. like right. but when you do read through it, it's like yep yeah yep, yeah we've got that we've got that you can do that it doesn't have vomiting into a bucket yeah. that's a children's book <laughs> maybe the next one anyway shelly ryan thank you for your time thank, thank you, you. Welcome back, everybody. I am here live with Joe Neat, executive producer for Sea of Thieves, reporting in live from Rare in the UK, where the team is holding their final beta right now. Joe, you must be so busy at the moment. Thank you so much for sparing some time to join us. What's the vibe like in the studio just now? Uh, it's crazy. It's like the, the, the anticipation you know, for launch that's coming up and also just the excitement now for the, um, the beta as it's live with loads of people monitoring everything that's going and the kind of um, the, the amount of players are climbing and climbing and climbing. You know, we've currently got our highest amount of players we've ever had playing Sea of Thieves at the same time, um, right, right now, which is just, it, it's amazing. And it's going to keep growing uh, through tonight, I think. Nice. And we can actually see some of those live stats behind you on the screen. So you, you're sitting in the, the lobby of the rear office uh, near Birmingham in the UK, right? Tell us about that screen behind you. Yeah, so uh, behind us here, we've got uh, a, a, some fun stats, nothing too kind of business critical that we're kind of sharing here. <laughs> um, but in the, bottom, in the bottom left, you can see that there's players kind of on, on adventures showing who's in solo crews, uh, who's duo crews, and who's in galleon crews, kind of which of those has been uh, selected today. So this is all kind of today's data, because it's really important to us that there's always a spread um, of players and kind of, you know, so, so there are people out there on their own, there are duos, there are um, the bigger ships. So you've got that real kind of mix. So when you're out there and you see that set of sales on the horizon. Um, first of all, you're trying to spot what kind of size it is, and then you don't really know how many people are, uh, are on those ships. Um, but yeah, really important to us as we, as we you know, um, grow this game and move forward that we've always got that balance. And so we, we, we take this data, and if it's going in the wrong direction, then we'll start tweaking things in, you know, behind the scenes and making decisions to, and to, to bring that back into, into balance. All right, so the final beta is happening right now. Everyone can download it is, and yes. play it this weekend. Anybody can, can go and play, yep. Fantastic. So it's, what are you showcasing yeah. in the final beta that you maybe haven't shown before? Um, so, so two major things. The first one is skeleton forts, um, which... Uh, I think we, t the, we talked about in one of the previous sections about this skull cloud on the horizon that you'll see appear. Um, it alerts everybody in the, in the world that there's um, a, a, a skeleton fort is now occupied. And if you kind of sail across there, the music will start playing. It's like, like your heart starts beating as you start approaching the fort with the, um, the cloud above it. And um, you know it's going to be populated by lots and lots and lots of very kind of angry and dangerous skeletons um, protecting the treasure that's in the, in the vault kind of at the, um, uh, the bottom. But you need to defeat all of those to get the key and unlock it. But at the same time, anyone else in that server could be sailing there. So um, you need to decide when you arrive whether to kind of, you know, crew up and, and kind of build that fragile alliance with people and hope that they don't betray you uh, as you're kind of fighting against all of these skeletons. Um, or perhaps you want, to, you want to go in there and, you know, maybe wait around a bit and then try and steal it off someone else. And it's... it's it's what's going to lead to just so many interesting stories where, you know, the choice is in players' hands. And we've been watching, um, you know, on the big screen behind us here, having kind of live streams and stuff on uh, Mixer and Twitch, just really loving seeing how this plays out differently every time. Um, and then alongside that, we've got the Merchant Alliance, which is one of the additional trading companies um, that are in there. And so they send you out in the world um, to collect animals for them at the moment. So um, we've introduced pigs and chickens um, into our world. So you get given a little crate. Um, you have to kind of hunt around 
find them in the world, um, and then take them back to a certain kind of outpost within a specified time. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it's really cool, the, the kind of reactions that you'll get from the animals. So the pigs, you know, you have to keep them fed, and um, so you need, like, and they love bananas. Like, it's renowned that pigs are big, fan, <laughs> big fans of bananas. Um, you love bananas, and, you know, we, we've done our, we've done our, we've done our research, yeah. <laughs> but, um, uh, and so, you know, you have to keep them fed and stuff. So if you're on an island and you spy a pig, if you get a banana out, then he'll kind of, he'll be friendly. You know, he won't be scared of you um, because he can smell that lovely, luscious um, uh, banana. But, you know, if you then switch to a gun, then the pig suddenly takes fright and flees off into the, into the hills. And it's, it's really funny. But um, one, of the, one of the kind of saddest things, I think, at the moment, actually, um, uh, that our players are discovering is right now there isn't a way to, if you kind of accidentally capture the wrong animal um, in a crate, um, you can't actually kind of release it from that crate yet. Oh. Um, and so there's only kind of one choice that you have if you want to kind of empty that crate. Don't and, say uh, it, Joe. Go and find the right animal. Don't say it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just going to leave that to the... <laughs> <laughs> leave that to your imaginations. But um, uh, yeah, so that's something that we'll be addressing in the future, I think. But at the moment, you've got to kind of take a deep breath and, uh, and kind of look, look the other way while you, uh, while you do what needs to be done. Do you think the Merchant Alliance might be interested in a couple of fine parrots? I could give them a good <laughs> price. I'm sure they will. <laughs> yes. Joking aside, I'm, I'm waiting for that to go terribly, terribly wrong. By the way, Graham, I've been waiting with bated breath. <laughs> no, well, that'd be good. Yeah, but they seem very well behaved. It'll make for good gifts. Let's just say that. Um, yeah. <laughs> the approach you've taken to Sea of Thieves all along is to bring the community and the players of the game with you as you, as you go through this development journey. Tell me about some of the feedback that community has given you over the past couple of years that has driven real change in the final game. Oh, it's. A lot of it has been around kind of frequency of ship encounters. That's probably been the one that we've had uh, most feedback on because it's a real balance within a shared world like Sea of Thieves to have that, you know, for those players that like to go out and hunting other pirates and having engaging in that kind of um, uh, player versus player combat, they want to be able to find other ships and stuff. But you've also got people who are kind of maybe in the mood for exploring and navigate and wandering around islands and stuff, and they need to have a bit of breathing space and everything else. So, so that... Um, kind of frequency of encounters between players. So something we've taken loads and loads of feedback on. We've used telemetry. Um, we've been sending surveys out, reading the forums, reading all social media. Um, and, it's, and it's something that we're pretty happy with at the moment, but we'll continue to kind of monitor it as we go because, you know, we've made a lot of changes to the view distance, so how far you can see other ships. We've introduced the spyglass, so you can kind of get up in the crow's nest and, and see things on the horizon. And all of those things really add to it because, like, you can see a ship a long way in the distance now, and, um, and you really get to make a choice as to whether to engage maybe you want to go a bit stealth and sail behind an island and hide there. Like you've you, you've really got that choice um, as players now. Um, but yeah, there's been so many, so many, um, so much feedback and ideas and and questions and everything. And it's and it's been an incredible journey to to bring this game to to market in the way that we have. Um, it's been something completely new for Rare, um, but it's been so rewarding. I think for us and, and for our community. And it's and it's not ending at launch. It's all in in you know in one way. It's also just starting there as we as we look to move forward beyond launch. You know, we're going to be operating in the same way. I want to come back to what happens after launch, but there's one thing I noticed has changed a little yep. bit recently is character selection. Can you tell us more about you know, yes. how you can choose your character and then the kind of customization you've got through the game? Uh, yeah, so um, basically we kind of wanted to try something a little bit different with um, character selection. Um, and we wanted to kind of in, like, encourage people to maybe come out of their comfort zone and, 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 tr and maybe pick a character type that they wouldn't normally go to um, if they were just faced with a kind of selection screen and a creator or something. Um, and we wanted every character to, to really represent a kind of the, the rare character, you know, the, the type of game, oh, sorry, type of character you'd see in a, in a rare game. And so when you, when you load up on the front end, you get this carousel of kind of eight characters, which you can refresh and it will kind of generate a different ones every single time. We call it our IPG, our kind of infinite pirate um, uh, generator. Nice. And so we've, we've put that in and we've been testing it with, with players and, and, you know, I personally love it because I just, I just look through until I find someone that's just a little bit oversized, a little bit kind of exaggerated and something that just is really going to stand out there in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but we've also seen feedback from our players around, like, they want a little bit more control. Um, and so, like, at the moment, like, our team working super hard towards launch and they're trying to get um, a little bit more control in there for launch. Um, and, and one of that is actually the ability to just kind of, if you find one that you, you think you like but you want to 
explore a bit more and refresh a bit more, um, you'll be able to kind of um, just press a button and it'll just save that one. And then you can, so then you can start refreshing the seven or then save another one, then the sixth. And, and so you can end up with a lineup of, of characters that you've, that you've kind of favorited uh, almost. So they're working super hard on that. It might make it in for launch, like, um, uh, we, you know, the team's working super hard, but if not, it'll be one of the kind of first post-launch updates. Um, and again, that's, that, that's how we're going to be operating this. You know, it's, it's about, let's put stuff out there. Let's try things a little different um, because we love doing that at, at Rare. Um, see how it lands and take that feedback and then look to improve and iterate. And that's just one of the examples of that. Great. Now, talking of feedback, this is something somebody told me. I didn't know about it, but I absolutely love it, right? I hear that you have been joining games in Sea of Thieves, like undercover, incognito journey, not oh. telling people that you, you, know, you work for Rare and you obviously you're you know, so um, important to the development of the game. What, what has your experience been like when you've been doing that? Like, what kind of things have you been hearing and has there been any moments that really stood out for you? Um, oh yeah, there's been so many. Like, um, I, what I love, why I do it is to, it's, one, it's to find out how our game is being played in the wild. You know, without any, if, if I was to kind of step on board and introduce myself as the, as the EP of the game, people might behave a little bit differently, mm -hmm. right? Maybe they'd start just, they wouldn't be giving me the right feedback. They'd just be, they wouldn't be playing it in the right way. So I just, I just in go in there and quietly almost pretend. Yeah, right. They'd probably <laughs> just do that straight away, yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, and so I just go in and just play along as almost like a new player and um, let people guide me. And I just see how they interact and how they work together and what their thoughts are and questions. And, and I love to hear them discussing things and speculating about stuff in the game. Um, and, and I remember um, joining this crew. Uh, there was like two um, players who were brothers. And one of the brothers was clearly the guy that was in charge. And he was like, as soon as I joined, he stated that he was the captain. And so he was in charge. He's going to be telling everyone what to do. And then introduced his brother and stuff. And we were off, off sailing. And, and he wanted to make friends with another crew. So we did that. And we joined up together. But then um, at a, cer a certain time of night, um, you can sometimes hear this really eerie creature noise in the world. Um, and someone like, was like, oh, what's that? What's that? And, uh, and he's like, oh, that's the Kraken. And, um, and, I, and I was like, raised an eyebrow at this time, because this was quite a few months ago. Yeah. And, um, and he's like, yeah, that's the Kraken. That's, that's in the world. It's like, so don't jump in the sea now. Don't, definitely don't jump in the sea, because it will be around. And, uh, and everyone was like, oh, really, really? Is that the case? And I was like, and I was just sitting there going, <laughs> pretty sure that's, that, that's not been put in the game yet. But, um, but I love that kind of... The, you know, players' imagination and the stories they tell each other and stuff um, uh, when they're playing together. And I, I just like being along for the journey. And I, and I tend to, at the end of a session, I'll, um, I'll let people know who I am and I'll kind of take their feedback and questions and stuff. Um, and I've, I've added a lot of friends on Xbox Live via that because, you know, I'd like, I love to play with those guys again in future and get their feedback as the game kind of grows and evolves. Great. Um, Creating stories together, Joel. That's what the game's all about, isn't it? That's Mate, I know you've got a game to get out the door in 10 days' time. That isn't the end of it for you. I know you've got a lot of work to do beyond that. Please Please send my love to all the team. I miss you all. Hopefully I'll get back over to see you soon. Thank you so much for joining us, Joe. Really appreciate it. Thank you. There you go, everyone. Joe, neat. Uh, so as you've seen, Sea of Thieves is brimming with charming features. But for me, busting out my hurdy-gurdy on the poop deck or playing a sprightly tune on the squeeze box atop the bow is pretty high on my list of favourites. And speaking of sweet, sweet music, Larry recently had the chance to jam with Rare's legendary composer Robin Beanland about how these classic instruments were brought to life on the high seas. I'm here with Robin Beanland. Robin is the music director here at Rare. Nice yep. to see you, Robin. Nice to meet you. Now, part of Sea of Thieves, one of the magical moments is the music. Thank it's you. certainly something that 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 I when I was playing the game it was it was expected yet unexpected some of those great moments. Tell us about the music in Sea of Thieves. Okay, so I think the, the one of the first sort of bits of feedback I got was what would a pirate orchestra sound like? So yeah. I started sort of thinking on that and thinking on the instruments that we'd use and it not being too perfect mm -hmm. and almost like the pirate is just getting around the instrument, not a virtuoso on it. They just sort of yeah. kind of carry a tune on it. Sure. So it was that kind of thing, getting all the creaks and the and the scratchiness of it. Tell us about the, the actual theme music when, when players are joining the game. That's something you wrote. It is, yeah. So the theme, usually, I mean, traditionally, when I come to write a theme for a game, I'll usually sit at the piano, noodle about, and sort of come up with some sort of melody. So the things we did was we wanted to create, I wanted to make some rhythm burns because I'd seen them, and I thought they were Now, really what are cool. these? These are cow ribs. OK. Um, and you play them. So I went to my local butcher and I said, uh, have you got any cow ribs, flat ribs? And he said, what are you making, spare ribs? And I said, no, I'm making some rhythm bones. And he's like, right. What? So I had my iPad because I thought I'm about to get that question. So I showed him, he said, oh yeah, you want the, you need the flat ribs. Come back on Friday. Okay. So I got, went back, got a bag of ribs. Uh -huh. 
boiled them off in my pan uh, at home and then cut them down to these. Um, and it took me about three days to try and get that technique down. But while I was, while I was sat in here, trying not to disturb everybody else, I was just going. So you're trying to find the sound. Yeah, and I, I was just messing around with that. I thought that's a, that's a pretty cool rhythm. And I started layering that rhythm up. So uh -huh. that's the first thing that I did for the Sea of Thieves theme. Mm -hmm. And then I put a melody to that, which is quite unusual for me. I and is thought. there a name of the song? Uh, I think we've called it Maiden Voyage. Now, I want to talk about some of the instruments, because some of yep. the instruments you use, you have some here. Why don't yep. you bring them up here? Yep. You've got this one here, which is a? Concertina. This is a concertina. Yep. Which looks like an accordion. What's the difference? Well, the accordion has the sort of piano keys either yep. side, and this is buttons. Okay. Could you play this for us? I can give you a little go on it. Okay, now this is this is actually the, the, the same instrument that people hear in the game. This is, if you pick up the concertina which is a, Which game, is something in-game you can do. This is, this is it. Okay. This is the one. Why don't you give us a so little it's, something? Um, We, we spent a long time going through a big cabinet of these at the shop. Yeah. And um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's a shop that sells these still. Yes. Okay. I didn't yeah, know that. I had a big cabinet full of them, and they all, and they all all really nice. Right. They all sounded really nice and really just a bit nice though. Too nice. Too nice. And then we landed. This one was skulking around the back, and so what's that? Let's have a go on that. Just just the notes are a bit kind of dull, and some don't work, and it's right. it's all really. Yeah. You can hear it breathing. Yeah. And it's just we record all that stuff in game, so you get that. And kind it adds of, life to the game. Yeah, it sounds like something that's been sort of living on a pirate ship and yeah. not, not taken care of. The other one is the hurdy gurdy, which yes. is this really fascinating, sophisticated instrument that this again is another instrument you can play in game. Yep. But you I know you're you're getting all strapped in here, which I am because it costs it costs a lot of money and I'm scared of dropping it. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. So this one here you can also play in game, but it's got a, it's got a very interesting sound. So yes. tell us about this. So this is a hurdy gurdy mm -hmm. and in it's kinda like a violin. But instead of having a bow, mm -hmm. like you have here, right? Instead of having the bow, instead of have a bow, you've got this this crank and a wheel. Okay. Yeah, that you. So this you is this, imagine this is the bow right here. This is the bow. Okay. Yeah. So go ahead and play it. And then you've got your, your melody strings here. Again, this is the same one that you used that you recorded in game. This sounds familiar. But you can play this in game, and you, this is the one you record. This is the one you play in game, and it's again, it's it's one of those things. It's we took a bit of artistic license with it. Um, you can't you can't play on the that's a drone string, so you can't play a ba a bass line on it other than yeah. that single note. So right. what I did is I used auto tune and kind of made made up bass line, so it, it was a bit more sort of harmonically interesting. So it's not accurate, but it's kind of believe it's, as long as it's believable in Sea of Thieves. Now I noticed when you're playing in the game. Um, if you and I, if I was playing this device and yes. you were to come along and you does the game does an interesting thing where you play, start playing in harmony together, right? Yes. So you're playing yep. and I'm playing all of a sudden the game just handles that. Yeah. So if you, if you start, if you start playing first, I can't play this at all. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> if you start playing first, right. you'll, you'll play the lead line. Right. And then if I join in on the hurdy, I'll start uh, accompanying you. What about this says pirate? I just think it's kind of, I mean, it kind of looks like a pirate ship for a start. Sure. Um, and it's just- That sound. It's just that sound and that scratchy, uh, I mean, when I first got it, I was pretty scared of it. Because when I, when I first I'm scared of it sitting thing, next I like, to you. I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do with that. But right. then it's just got that kind of scratchy, horrible, clicky, piratiness to it, yeah. I think. Now I, I wanna talk about this other, this fascinating device over here. Let's pull this out here. Now this is actually one I can play. Now what what is the name of this one? This is a water phone. This is a water phone. Now yep. what is so I'm gonna I'm gonna draw this across here. We're gonna make it work, shall we? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Fascinating. So how do, where did you use this in game? You'll hear this a lot on the ghost ship on the Ferry of the Damned. If you get to the edge of the world, you'll hear I use this water phone and then I put it through a, a 
a piece of software called Pull Stretch, mm -hmm. which can do this amazing time stretch. And it, it, just because it's so, it's so harmonically interesting. It, right. When it's stretched out, it creates this amazing sort of soundscape. You really were allowed a creative license to go through and, and create the sound for Sea of Thieves out of using a variety yeah. of different instruments. I think that's the thing. I think we just wanted to sort of get these instruments and play them, not necessarily in the right, correct way that you should play them, just right. to try and create this sort of signature right. sound for Sea of Thieves. So right. that if you hear it, you go, that's Sea of Thieves. Yeah. That, that sound palette is Sea of Thieves. Yeah. And the way we make it work in game is, it's not just a piece of music that starts from here and goes to there and then loops around. It's it's broken out into individual bits that trigger and it and it's it has a life of its own beyond me. If you know right. what I mean. The software drives it and it feels like it's part of the universe and it's it's on the wind. Yeah, between the concertina and the hurdy gurdy, these are things that you normally wouldn't expect in game, but when they're there, yep. they just provide those delightful yep. little moments. Yeah. Thank you, Robin. Thank you very much. Player Unknown's Battlegrounds launched late last year into Xbox Game Preview and very quickly became a worldwide phenomenon. Now we are joined by Nico Bahari, executive producer at Microsoft, who's working very closely with the PUBG Corp on Player Unknown's Battlegrounds for Xbox One. And I have to say, I'm amassing quite a, a great sneaker collection. I love your all-stars. Thank you, appreciate it. Now Nico, I wanna first of all thank you for joining us. You didn't bring one, but you brought two chicken dinners. You brought the one over there and then there's one on your shirt. So you're yeah. all about chicken dinners. All good, yes. Now, working on uh, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, or PUBG as they call it, um, there may be some people that aren't familiar with the game. There may be like, I don't know, this many people in the world, but why don't you just kind of level set everybody so we can get started? Sure, if you're not familiar with the Battle Royale genre, PUBG is a one versus 100 last man standing event set on the fictional island of Erangel. Everyone starts off every match equal in the back of a giant plane as it's flying over Erangel, where you can strategically decide where you're going to eject from the moment that you hit the ground, the clock is running, the map is slowly shrinking, and your job is to very quickly gather resources, armor, and weaponry, so that way as the conflict starts to shrink down in the center of the map, you can do everything you can to become the last person standing. You make it sound very simple, I should have to say. It's, it's, it is obviously, that's yeah. why you get the chicken. So we've been playing, Larry and I, yeah. since uh, since it launched into game, uh, game preview last December, yep. and the game's advanced quite a bit. How has the Xbox Game Preview program helped the development of PUBG on Xbox? It's been a really powerful tool. Xbox Game Preview allows developers to come very early in development to our marketplace. Um, and through that, you can engage a very early conversation and dialogue with your community, all in increasing the quality and the experience over time. You know, we're never, we're never really done with PUBG, right? This is a game that lives forever, right? We're constantly iterating and developing on it. And Xbox Game Preview, you can see even over time the incremental improvements that we've made to the experience. And I want to talk about that because just last week you released the latest patch. I think there's been like nine since you released the game in December, right? Yeah, we've been very quick to deliver patches, yeah. you know, uh, constantly trying to in improve the overall experience optimize the frame rate, you know. Now we've just recently uh, released our spring Xbox roadmap that's, yeah. you know, in addition to continued optimization and bug fixing, which is just something that we're gonna be doing every day. Um, there's also big content chunks that we're looking at. Everything from um, things like emotes and customization options to, you know, a, we're super excited to talk about Miramar, which is the desert map that's gonna be coming to our platform as mm -hmm. well. And as a, as a vehicle for for players to get an early look at it, we'll be launching the Xbox test server for PUBG. So anyone that has PUBG or owns PUBG will be able to download the Miramar test server and provide us great feedback and hop into the desert map this spring. And that's actually, when you when you boot up PUBG, you'll go in, you'll be able to choose one or the other, right? Uh, we're gonna figure out what's the proper way. <laughs> well, when it comes to, you know, when we start off with Miramar, it'll be on a dedicated test yeah. server. So yeah. we're gonna wanna funnel everyone, and we'll probably have some dedicated nights that we where we celebrate, hey, come join us for Miramar. Right. And then we'll figure out what how we're gonna sort of present that option to players when it, when it finally releases. Now, for those folks that are home, like Jeff and I, that play quite a bit, you have played the heck out of this game. You work on the game, you work yeah. with the teams. Tell us a little bit about some best practices, as we say. You know, what, what, what's the best thing? Like, where to land? What to worry about? What not to worry about? Do you stay with the as the zone closes? How do you stay alive? How do you win? How do yeah. you win the chicken dinner? I, I mean, some people that are really like I've seen you on the kill feed a lot. I think you're, you know, you're pretty good. Dying though on the wrong side uh, of the kill yeah, feed. I think you've done pretty good for yourself. It depends on what kind of player you are. Yeah, that's really the beauty of PUBG is that players can express themselves and they can jump into Erangel and play however they want. If you want to go where the conflict is, you know, head towards the center of the map where there's a lot of density of players. If you're like me and you kind of want to hang around and be sneaky 
Kentucky, you can start off on the peripheral. The one thing that I would recommend to everyone is just remember where the plane comes in, where you feel like most of the players are going to drop, so you understand as the circle is shrinking, where is the best strategic place to line yourself up towards sort of the end game of yeah. the experience. Yeah, that's one thing that Jeff and I have done, and I've done it with some, one of my other squad mates, is we'll look at the flight path, and a lot of people forget about the yeah. flight path, you're right, and we'll, we'll drop down and maybe go to a far corner and start looting because we'll have that to ourselves and, and hope that the circle is kind to us. Yeah. yeah. So, let me, so a couple, a couple of like big pro tips that you can't forget. You got to get good at using the back button to survey the the inventory because sometimes things are laying on top of each other. Like a jacket might be hover, like covering like a, yeah. a really good weapon. Yep. So using back button really fills your inventory with the options that you need to. Or hitting through. the hamburger button so you can see everything that's in that pile and yes. just picking the things that you yes. want. Yes. Yeah. Uh, also, double click from a still position will auto run you, which will enable you to uh, use a much more freer version of free look without. Um, interfering with the direction that you're going. Right, and free look is this concept where you hold the, the right bumper down, you can sp so you're still running in one direction, but you're able to actually spin around to see if there's somebody coming up behind you I, or whatnot. I use it to run away from people that are, you know, aiming down at me. Right, well, that's also, that'll also <laughs> Don't just drop, by the way. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. what everyone does. They're like, just please, run. go ahead and yes. drop. Yeah, yeah, make it easy for us. It's, I mean, there's, there's a lot going on in this game. I remember the first time I played it when mm -hmm. we played it back in December. Of course, I played it on PC. It's been out for about a year. But, but, but jumping in, it's a little daunting, but the great thing about it is, is you play it, and if you if you're out, mm -hmm. you hit a button, you're you're right back into the next match, right? That's it. And and it's you know for me, I equate it to golf because I'm kind of terrible. But every time that you play around in golf, you get a little bit better. And yep. PUBG is the same way too. Every time you get in, you get better at understanding the environment, learning the landscape, and really getting good at the inventory management, which is a lot of this game. Something we're not getting good at is learning how to pronounce all of these different places. Yeah, exactly. I, I actually so I actually have a map here, Nico. I'm going to pull this out, and this is the this is the official. A uh, visitor's map for Erangel. Uh, Just picked that up at yeah. AAA. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Tip AAA. <laughs> so this is the AAA map, and I, I was when Jeff and I were looking at the map. One of the challenges we're into is the moment we we spawn in, and you're you know you're flying over this. You're like, where do we go? What do we do? How do you pronounce some of these names? Like, is that Yasna Palyana? Is that is that? And you always just go by the first name. Kameski. Yasnaya. Yasnaya. Um, I mean, there's some Milta. I mean, there's there's some difficult places in here. But some of the name places actually are good to go to, but some yes. of the non, like for instance, you know, Gatka is a place that my crew tends to go to a lot. Mm -hmm. There's only about five houses there, so it doesn't deserve to be named. Yeah, it, it doesn't have a mayor or anything. Yeah, right. It's un unincorporated. It's unincorporated. Yeah. It's something tanks all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, so there, I mean, there's, it's really, it's really, you know, that's we talked about the strategy of water lane and how to land, but one of the things I've noticed for playing for the past three or four months is really about knowing the map. Mm -hmm. You need to know the terrain, and I'm getting to know the terrain. I know you know it, Jeff. I know you know it very yeah. well. It's just spending time out there and, and the valuable of looking around, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, you have to understand the terrain if you're in a vehicle and you're driving at full speed trying to navigate around because I'm sure you've ran into things and knowing where there's holes and fences. Yeah. Like having, a, having an escape plan is very critical. Those ditches out near Gatka, why are they there? I, I can't drive through them. And so that way you get a little bit. Yeah, you get a little bit of that, right? <laughs> well, yeah, and let's not talk about the design of the houses. I, I'd love to speak with some of the interior designers of, of Wrangell. I'm like, I would not put a stairway in there. We talked at the beginning of the show about, uh, about PUBG and talking to the community and, and PUBG moments are famous for their unpredictability. So we've asked the community to submit some of their favorites. So let's see over to the social desk. What do you guys have? I mean, we talk about unpredictability and design and all these things that go into making a game like PUBG. That goes out the window when community gets into it. First of all, <laughs> Arendelle has been said a million times and I was still worried about saying it myself. Larry, you pulled out your <laughs> archaic map. I'm going to show you what <laughs> everyone else has going map. on. The community this is a real map that you absolutely need to study. <laughs> right. And this has made the rounds before, so I'm sure this is no surprise to any we, of y'all. Yeah. If you're looking for top tips on where to go and where not to go, this is your go-to guide. question mark. That's yeah. my favorite. Oh, really? Well, I mean, it's so true. No point that. over here. Prone city. Yeah. Oh, that's See, now, I, dis I disagree with no point because Jeff and I... That's where we always go. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> so, and that's why we never win. <laughs> We're actually going all the way up the West Coast. Uh, oh, that's It's a guys, leisurely huh? drive. It's, it's beautiful. beautiful. I mean, it's hey, beautiful. nothing the over there but no point. But it's all right. I mean, you know, this is subjective, right? right of course. <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't top tips. Yes. But then What else you got for us, guys? Well, you know what? I'm just going to have to go with this one. It's a GIF, actually, as a matter of fact. And yes, I said GIF. It's okay. It we won't good. argue that point. <laughs> Dropping in and all of a sudden having nowhere to go. Absolutely yeah. nothing. That's it. Oh. We're at the end of it. I mean, technically, oh. you know, that. barring the zone oh, coming down on top of you. Out. Yeah, all right, all right. So that's out here. And last but not least, I mean, we're going unpredictable because we can't talk enough about that chicken here. I, I want to know who wore it better. 
<laughs> you know, we've got the, the PUBG dinner that's here, adorned with gear all around, and then we've got the chicken dinner that's over on the Look, side. Look, any chicken dinner is a good chicken dinner. Yes. I, I, that being said, I'm going to call dibs on the Pinterest chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, you got it on Pinterest? <laughs> that's oh, not fair. Jim. All right, well, our friends at Studio Wildcard and Snail Games made waves with the Pixar announcement last year, but the wait for this charming pixel-like survival extravaganza is nearly over. Take a look. Joining us now is Navin from Studio Wildcard to discuss all things Pixar. Welcome to Inside Xbox, Navin. How are you Thank feeling? You. Thank you. I'm feeling good. First time here. Good. And you must be feeling especially good because Pixar now has a release date, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be coming out on March 27th on Xbox Games Preview, so we're really excited for it. Fantastic. Now, the team's had amazing success with ARK Survival Evolved. Where did the idea for Pixar come from? Yeah, um, so for Pixar, we wanted to expand the ARC IP to a younger audience. You know, as you know, if you played ARC, it's, uh, it's a pretty hardcore game. It's pretty unforgiving, especially for the new player. And uh, we wanted to take the core survival mechanics of ARC um, and added the creative, you know, block building system to it. And here we have Pixar. You know what I love about this is because I'm, I'm a dad myself, right? And uh -huh. my boys play video games. I can see ARC Survival Evolved players uh -huh. being able to play Pixar with their kids. Yeah. That's great, right? Yeah, I think that was one of the major ideas behind it, too. All right. So I think we've got some footage of the game here running. You know, everything that people know about ARC Survival Evolved is, is really going to show up in here, right? We've got mm -hmm. the dinosaurs, we've got the crafting, we've got the exploration. But tell us how, they, how the game actually works. Yeah, so, you know, you spawn in the game in the world, you're actually coming down on a balloon. Um, and then you start off, you know, with, with nothing, um, which is, you know, it's kind of scary at first, but, you know, it's a, it's a lot more toned down, it's more simplified. You'll be able to build your character up, you know, from the ground, you'll get a base up and, and building, you'll craft some weapons, some here and there, and then, uh, you know, you go straight on to taking on the world. You know, we got quests, we got procedurally generated maps, so it's all sorts of different exciting things to go on nice. and to do. And we saw some, some great building footage in there as well, right? Now, you've actually got a, a create mode in the game, so if you just want to get in and be creative and build things, you can do that as well, yeah? Yeah, we wanted to get this one right out of the gate. Uh, we think it would be a fun mode for um, people to get, it, get into and um, you know, build stuff up, do whatever they want, you know, without the hassle of dealing with enemies or anything right. like that. No stress, I like that. Now, uh, Ark Survival Evolved has always you know, had a great um, uh, history in game preview and kind of developing with the community. You know, how are you going to take those learnings and put them into Pixar? Yeah, I mean, we'll be doing the same approach. You know, I think game preview is a great way to get the game out to the players and have them experience it and tell us what they think. And then we'll be using their feedback, you know, through the forums, through social media, and figure out, you know, what we can do to make Pixar a very enjoyable experience for everyone. Nice. Naven, great to meet you. Thanks mm -hmm. for, for coming on and talking to us. Remind everyone when Pixar is coming to Xbox Game Preview. Yeah, so Pixar is coming out on March 27th uh, for Xbox Games Preview uh, very soon. Yeah. Nice. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, if I say to you, Vass and Pagan Min, yep. You are thinking of Far Cry. Those games are infamous for bringing us some of gaming's most memorable baddies, and Far Cry 5's cult leader, Joseph Seed, is no exception. So braving the wilderness of Hope County itself, Larry had a chance to chat with Far Cry 5 writer Drew Holmes and lead actor Greg Burke. So sit up straight and be polite, because you're about to meet the father. Hey, it's Larry here of Xbox Live's Major Nelson. We are in Hope 
County from Far Cry 5. We're here to take a look at the game. We're going to talk to the head writer and we're going to meet Greg Burke, the actor who plays the latest and perhaps the most sinister villain of the franchise. Let's take a look. Drew, set the stage for Far Cry 5 for us. <sighs> Far Cry 5 brings the franchise to America for the first time, specifically to Hope County, Montana, where a, a doomsday cult led by Joseph Seed called the Project Eden's Gate has taken over the county, and the player is a rookie sheriff's deputy who's tasked with trying to arrest him. And like all Far Cry scenarios, it, it doesn't go well, uh, and the player is sort of lost behind enemy lines, and, and they're tasked with trying to, to take this guy down. I save souls. But unlike the chosen one sent before, God will never let you take me. I was reticent at first about being involved in a video game because I'm not familiar with the world. And then they sent me some writing for Joseph, this monologue in particular that was one of the most harrowing pieces of writing that I'd ever got to tackle. And, uh, and I said yes, and I put it on tape, and, and they responded to it, and it's been an extraordinary collaboration. Literally one of the happiest creative journeys of my life. What did you tap into in your inner self to kind of create this, this insanity? Well, I, I think that um, it's a character who has been stripped of the comforting insulation of love as a child, and, and people that are alone and frightened, they build a system around themselves, a belief system around themselves. So for me, it was struggling with the loss of love and and really needing to connect to people and have people in my world and create this family. And there's also the element of being ordained by God, hearing God's word and trying to fulfill his prophecy and save as many people as I can. So it was it was a dark currents that we, we tended to swim in, but they were rewarding in the end. I was chosen by God. I helped the blind to see. Rarely has a voice actor look so similar to the actor, the character in the game. How, what was that like? Did you draw from it, or what? tell we me? We actually a bit. ended up uh, just purchasing Greg's likeness. <laughs> 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 because the thing was, like, you know, when he put that audition on camera, it, we had been searching all over, across Canada, across the United States, for someone that could could really make us believe that that this could be a cult leader, that, that we would want to join this guy's cult. Yeah. And the minute that we watched this audition tape, there was something about the the honesty that he brought to the scene. Mm -hmm. um, th there was a truthfulness, um, and, and you, you sort of felt yourself understanding where he came from, but at the same time being terrified of it. Tell me about the collaboration and learning about cults. I assume you're not in one yourself. I am not yet. <laughs> the cult of The cult yeah. of video games yeah. now. <laughs> It was a very personal journey in this. So much of the game is me interacting with the player in a really intimate way or with my, with Jacob or John or Faith and also going through these great crises of faith within myself. So it was a much more, it was a much more uh, internal mm -hmm. struggle for me. And I, um, as a father of a family, I understand what it means to try to hold people together and sometimes force them to do things that they don't want to do because you feel you know best. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wasn't, I wasn't honestly as concerned with the bigger picture. I was concerned with the moment to moment and this, this dangerous intimacy that we were able to create. What is working on video games, what has that showed you in terms of, uh, in terms of this industry? I was, I was amazed at how um, accommodating the process is. After the first little bit, you get used to the suit and the dots and having a camera and a light right in your face and that, and I can't speak for every video game, but the Ubisoft team that we were lucky, that I was lucky enough to work with ha had such um, a respect for the process of finding an emotional truth mm -hmm. that everything in the bomb was geared towards creating those moments. And it was, it was like doing a play. It was a little bit different than film, but to me it was the closest approximation was doing a play. Mm -hmm. And you still are trying to create truthful, honest moments with either the other uh, characters in the game they're interacting with, or we were also very lucky that the player was represented not just by a camera, but there was a person wearing it, so I could actually talk to someone and commune with someone mm -hmm. as we were recording it. I really was overjoyed and surprised by the process. I didn't know what it would be like, and it was really intimate, and you were able to go to some very honest, difficult places. That's a look at Far Cry 5 coming out March 27th to Xbox One, and it is Xbox One X Enhanced. Hope you enjoyed this first look. Thanks for watching. Back in the summer of 2003, I was at a friend's house, and for the first time ever, they pressed 
this controller into my hand and I played Halo Combat Evolved for the first time and my life was definitely changed. I mean, 15 years later, I'm here and I uh, actually hadn't gotten a chance to really play with the Duke ever since. So it's amazing to be joined now by Seamus Blackley, one of the original leaders of the Xbox team, who is teaming up with Hyperkin to spearhead bringing the Duke back. So first of all, let's talk about who you are and what your role was in the founding of Xbox. <laughs> well, hey, it's nice to be here. Uh, it's super great to have an opportunity to talk about this thing. Um, so Xbox was actually an idea that uh, was uh, a response to some Sony PR that I read right before getting on a flight to Boston. And by the time I came back to Redmond, I had this, this whole presentation about how we should take the graphics technology I was working on for Windows and make a specific, you know, set PC whose specs wouldn't change so we could compete with the PlayStation. And the next thing you knew, it was a game console. And, and here we are. And here we are. So uh, tell us, um, why the Duke? And why now? Well, uh, it actually arose out of a joke. I was going through a bunch of old boxes to try to like, get rid of you know, the stack of boxes you have in your garage. And uh, a bunch of them were from my office at Microsoft, sort of, you know, sort of archeological samples of the year 2003 AD. And in, the, in one of the boxes was an original Duke. And so I got my youngest son to pose for a picture with his little hands. And I made some kind of joke on Twitter about, look, you, know, you could land a helicopter on this and it takes 30% of the world's plastic supply to make this, right? Because when I was first out pitching Xbox, yes. you know, because I was essentially fronting this thing uh, to the public, uh, I, got, I just took an incredible amount of crap about the size of the controller. It was huge and people really didn't like it. Uh, I had things thrown at me on stage by people. That seems a bit excessive. It was, it was, people were really passionate about it. And so, you know, we, we changed the controller. That's its own story. We released the controller S, uh, and that became the de facto controller, which is the, you know, the sort of the starting point of the evolution of Xbox controllers today. And so I expected I'd make this joke on Twitter. People would have a laugh. Somebody would, you know... Uh, Photoshop and Duke controller like hovering over cities from, you know, uh, like an alien Stairs, invasion think, yeah. movie. Yeah. And uh, instead, I got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of responses saying, well, I love the Duke. It was a formative controller for me. You know, it's so great. And uh, one fan said, you should bring it back. And so I said, aha, you know, you know, retweet this. You want to bring it back. Like, boom, like 700,000 retweets or some crazy number like this. Uh, and, you know, I, I get a private message from Phil. Uh, and Phil says, hey, so, you know, maybe we could do that. And here we are now. Seems like a recurring theme for you. Once someone says something online, you're like, you know what, we're going to do it. And we're just going to well, get it, whether look, it's the Xbox or the Duke. Here's the thing, you know, the, 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 the trick about, uh, about life, I think, in getting cool things to happen is just not giving up on a cool idea. And, you know, Xbox is an example of, uh, you know, a really small group of people. I mean, at one point it's me on a plane, and I come back and I tell my best friends, and then it's four people, and then it's six, and then it's eight people who share this vision. And look, we have all of this now. And this is the same kind of story. You know, it's like, look, all of these people loved this controller so much. And what a beautiful way to end the story of all of the abuse that I took in 2001 to have all of the people here now, you know, able to play this new controller. And you didn't just bring the Duke back in, in the form that it is here. It's better. What used to be just a sort of a hard, like inert piece of plastic now has like, it's actually the coolest part. Yes, and, and we can probably uh, show that this actually plays the original Xbox boot up, yep. which is another interesting story in and of itself. But uh, yeah, when, when we were gonna re-release it, uh, I knew that it was gonna be a trick to get Microsoft to agree to let a third party take the, uh, the design and release it and to take the, the logo mm -hmm. and put it on a product, on a third party product, these things hadn't been done before. And Phil Spencer, like bless his soul, allowed us to do that. But I felt that wasn't gonna be enough because it, you know, it needed to be updated to be somewhat modern. So I, I took out my knife and my hot glue gun and I pasted in an OLED display on it at my kitchen table. And I put a video of that on the internet so that it was you know, uh, sort of impossible to ignore. And, and it was. Uh, and, and, and that caused Microsoft to be kind enough to allow us to put the OLED display in. That's not the only nod to modernity. Uh, back in the old days, there was no bumpers on, on the OG Xbox. You had these black and white Ooh. buttons, but you, had to, you, you were able to address that as well. In the yeah, well, we had to go through several iterations because one of the deals with, uh, with the license was that we had to keep the industrial design the same. So how do you put bumpers on something and keep the industrial design the same? So we tried, and I think we succeeded in making useful bumpers. Um, I know people are going to have different opinions about them, but we did our best, and you know, we'll see how it works out. Uh, but I think this controller should be capable of playing any modern game. 
All right, well, definitely looking forward to it. I know I've been watching Ryan McCaffrey's Twitter very jealously, and it, it's great to see the new Duke in person. Thank you so much, Seamus, for being with us. Coming up next, we're going to have a live interview and a demo for some exciting new features that are coming to Xbox that we're going to debut right here, and one for Mixer that you do not want to miss. But first, we return to the topic on everybody's mind. Not only is Sea of Thieves coming on launch day in just 10 days to Xbox Game Pass, but it is also an Xbox Play Anywhere title. Now that means whether you buy it outright or you play it through Xbox Game Pass, you can play it on Xbox One and Windows 10. Heck, you can do it with the Duke. So your save travels with you no matter what platform you play on, and you can play uh, cross-platform as well. So Major Nelson spoke with Ted Timmons from Rare, to talk about how he uh, tackled the Windows 10 version and what that means for every Sea of Thieves fan. Take a look. I'm here with Ted Timmons, who's going to tell us about the Windows 10 version of Sea of Thieves. Ted, great to see you. Yeah, great to be here. Now, Sea of Thieves is an Xbox Play Anywhere title, which yes. means when I when I get the Xbox One version, I get the uh, Windows 10 mm -hmm. version at, at no additional cost, right? Yeah. Now, you had a, your team has been working on this for quite some time, parallel with the Xbox version. Tell us what we can expect. Well, it's important to us very early on that two years lead time to March 20th, you think, right, what, what do PC players expect and how do we meet those expectations? Yeah. And of course, expectations can be pretty lofty on, on the PC side. So we just set out to really create a PC game that not just you know has unlocked frame rates and ultra wide support etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh, yeah. there was actually a real person running past. No, they've left a gunpowder kick. <laughs> okay, this could this all go wrong. <laughs> Stand by. <laughs> but uh, then, then of course you you looked beyond that and you go, well, why can't PC players play games with Xbox players? Like yeah. that's, that's something that we absolutely should support, and that was an important part of why we wrapped in uh, Xbox Play Anywhere in August last year. Now I know in in January when we had the beta mm -hmm. that uh, I was playing on PC and I had friends playing on console. Yeah. I mean, it's completely seamless. Yes. Yeah. It feels the same, it looks the same, but your team has done uh, done a lot of things to really optimize it for the PC yes. players, right? Well, whenever we add a feature, whether it's that's a PC feature or an Xbox feature, we always think, why isn't that on a console? Why isn't that on a PC? So right. for example, when we did the field of view slider on PC, because that's an expectation, we had a conversation of why doesn't that exist on a console? So yeah. we gave it to our players. When we did keyboard and mouse rebindings, we then did controller rebindings likewise for, for uh, console console players. Mm -hmm. um, we've just had this uh, like parity approach just because we want to make sure that whenever we release a version of Sea of Thieves, it's one build that goes to all of our players. We actually call it no asterisks crossplay. Okay. That's like been our mantra and I think it's just about breaking down barriers and just letting people play it just how works. they want to play. It just works. Right. I don't want to do a disservice to all the infrastructure work that's gone on to make sure. it's a bit of a dark art, but right. yeah, the fact that Well, I'm we just saying is on, that, that there's a lot of people that that do all the hard work yeah, so absolutely. that it just works. Yeah. They're, they're they're doing we, a lot of work. We literally flicked a switch. Now, I want to talk about the settings because you had a little bit of fun with the settings in there because Sea of Thieves was, is going to run on a variety of hardware, yes. right? Yes, yeah, we aimed at the 4K ultra unlocked frame rate, just as you expect. Right. Uh, but at the same time, we wanted to support 540p, 15 frames a second. And it goes back to that mantra of letting people play how they want to play. Right. So when it came to the settings, yeah. we were like, well, we could do minimum, low, medium, high, ultra. But that, or... do, that doesn't work in the world of Sea <laughs> of Thieves, does it? Yeah. Tell us about them. So uh, <laughs> instead, we've got Cursed Common Rare, which is medium, so medium rare, which right. works quite well, right. uh, all the way through to legendary and mythical. And again, right. it's just like that fun tonal quirk that you, you kind of expect from a, a studio like Rare. I also want to point out that the team that worked on this build is, is in-house. Mm. The PC, yeah. you know, the PC team is actually here at Rare, right? Yeah, like I say, when, when we started this in earnest two years ago, we thought, what doesn't create a port? When you think about how PC games are often made, it's very much that you make the console version and then you make the PC version and it's another studio you who ship it, it six off, months so later. Off, right. yeah. Yeah. And we thought for us to really succeed as a service, then we need to always be in lockstep with, with console and PC. Right. So by making that process two years ago, it's just meant that ever since then, we're just always delivering to both platforms at the same time. And we had this, it's a bad pun. I don't know if I should make it on, on telly, but uh, the only port should be opposite to starboard. There you go. Okay, well, but, but, it's, but to your point about it being no asterisks is yeah. exactly that, is yeah. that this is exactly the way it should be and there's yeah. no compromise. Yeah, completely. And we knew that by owning it in-house, we would just have full control over the quality. And of course, working with the community, when we gave them the access to the PC version uh, almost a year ago now, um, we knew that, like, hey, we want to build this game with you and all your expectations will ultimately be realized by working with us and giving us feedback on, on the game. Thank you, Ted. Awesome, thank you. I'm glad that, that uh, gunpowder keg hasn't gone off, by the way. It's just been sat there. Yeah. Like... <laughs> and the Hyperkin. Thank you everybody for showing Seamus and the Hyperkin Duke some appreciation, everybody. Seamus has left this super limited edition green prototype 
of the Duke behind on the set. And I'm taking it home. Yeah, that, uh, that's not leaving here with and anybody. And good night, everybody. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. You know what? I think we need to give this away. I, I got somebody here who looks primed and ready. I mean, the controller collection looks beautiful. Way, I think to, be, we can do way this. to be on, like, on top of everything. Almost and like look, I did my job. Making me look great. I'm all like, so, anyway. So that's Max Locust. <sighs> Max Locust. This Duke is coming to you. It is absolutely coming to you. I was like, wait, isn't you. it that his name? No, we're not calling him that. But We're Max Locust, this Duke is I coming to you. Either. Thank you so much for sending us that picture. And again, keep it locked here because we have more coming up. Larry? All right, it is getting a wee bit crowded here on the Inside Xbox stage as we welcome a few new friends to the table to debut some brand new features coming to your Xbox One very soon. We're here with Jordan Ronica and Ornt I'm sorry, I couldn't pronounce your name. Could you pronounce it for me? It's Antal. Antal, thank you very much. Antal, you're from AMD. You guys from Microsoft want to thank you guys for joining us. We're going to talk about some really cool stuff. Now, next week, Xbox Insiders in the Alpha Ring will be able to start using AMD Radeon FreeSync displays for variable refresh rate output on Xbox One S and Xbox One X. Now, Antal, I want to, what does that mean? Could you explain to us what FreeSync is? Sure, absolutely. So, uh, first of all, really psyched to be on the show. Thank you. Um, really stoked about, you know, Xbox being the, Xbox One being the first, uh, outside of the PC ecosystem device to, to, uh, to adopt FreeSync. Mm -hmm. So FreeSync basically, if you have a display gaming on it, usually it has a, uh, a standard refresh, a fixed refresh of 60 hertz. So okay. the screen will always refresh 60 times a second. Okay. So the, the GPU or the, the console is trying to output the game at that exact rate, mm -hmm. but sometimes it goes above and, and it, sometimes it goes lower. Sure. Um, so you can, you can see artifacts like stuttering and, and tearing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure everybody who's a, who's a gamer has seen those artifacts before. So what FreeSync does is it gets, basically get, gets rid of those artifacts. So it's a smooth gaming experience. Can you tell us what's going on under the hood between the console, the display, and the GPU? Tell me a little bit about, let's open up the hood and tell me about the technology. So, sure, so, um, so AMD supplies the chips for, for the Xbox One mm -hmm. console. So uh, basically what it does, it, uh, it allows, FreeSync allows the monitor refresh to synchronize to the uh, to the output of the of the game. So yeah. if it, if the game renders at 45 frames per second, the, the monitor can go to 45 frames per second, and that will result in a really smooth gaming experience. And usually, when you hook up a device to a monitor, it just outputs the device. But there's actually the monitor and the the device. In this case, the Xbox uh, One S or the X. They're actually communicating a little bit, right? Exactly. They're 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 in full synchronicity. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, Whatever the, the GPU or the, the Xbox is putting out uh, for the game, that's exactly what the monitor is going to. Now, uh, I know what a lot of my tech friends are going to ask is, well, Antal, what version of FreeSync are we using here? So that's yeah, what I'm absolutely. going to ask you. <laughs> so the Xbox One S and the Xbox One X are going to use FreeSync 2, which okay. means um, it also supports HDR, which is high dynamic range rendering. I'm sure the Xbox One fans are uh, familiar with that. So yeah. that's the new version of FreeSync 2. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, mean, I know I'm looking forward to getting a hands on that. Of course, you'll need a display that supports that. It, exactly. It, uh, it, it requires a, a FreeSync display that is capable of FreeSync over the HDMI output. There you go. All right. Now, one of my next, one of the next things we're talking about is one of my favorite features, and I'm going to talk about using game mode on their TV. Now, I know some people may at home may use it. You may not know what it is, but we're going to do something a little different, right? With, aren't we going to do that, Jordan? We are. So if you're not using game mode right now, whenever you're playing your games, you really should be. Uh, right. It's, it's, a lot of people don't know what it is, but it's a, a special low-latency video mode okay. that your TV has. So oftentimes, it'll completely bypass some of the video processing that a TV would otherwise be doing. Because I know a lot of people get their Xbox home or their console, and they turn it on, and all of a sudden, they're like, well, it's, it looks like a soap opera. Yeah, yeah. Right? Or you might get like some weird little effects yeah. around your character. That's not coming from the console. That's being done by the TV. Right. But turning on game mode gets rid of all that. But you have to usually, and, and everybody calls it different. Some, a lot of them call it yep. game mode. But it's always in a different place sometimes at the top of the monitor. You know, sometimes you got to figure out where in the menu to find it based on the manufacturer. Right, right. And and sometimes you might run into a circumstance where you you have game mode turned on for your game, but maybe you want to use it. Uh, or turn it off whenever you're going to doing something like watching a Netflix video sure. or you know going to YouTube. So there's something new, something new that's enabled by the HDMI 2.1 spec called auto low latency mode. Okay. And what that basically does is it lets the Xbox One tell the TV whenever you're about to start playing a game so it can automatically turn on game mode so you can benefit from that low latency and that reduced input lag. So whenever you do something, whenever you press a button on your controller, you're going to see that change happen more quickly on a TV. It's happening very quickly anyway, yeah. but you're reducing that input lag. And that's huge because now you don't have to like, oh, I'm going to play a game now. Let me go find the controller, dig down, turn it on. 
on, play your game, play your game for two, three, four days, and you want to watch a movie or maybe something else, you don't want to turn it off. This will actually handle all of that seamlessly. For exactly, you. exactly. So the moment you go into a game, game mode turns on. As mm -hmm. soon as you drop out of a game, that low latency mode turns back off, and you can still go and watch a video and have all the video processing happen on the TV. When can we see that? So uh, we're going to go ahead and turn on that feature in just a few days. Mm -hmm. um, TVs that support that feature are going to be coming out soon. Uh, Samsung was nice enough to loan us a TV that we, uh, we did a little testing on the other day. I think we have some, some footage of that that we may have been showing. Uh, but those will be coming out later in 2018. That's exciting. Now, I understand we've also got some changes coming to the browser on Xbox One X, Microsoft Edge. Yes, yes. So we introduced a bunch of new features last week, and the new Microsoft Edge browser was one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you previously had used the, the Microsoft Edge browser on Xbox One, it was kind of the older Windows 8 style. Well, now we've updated so that the Microsoft Edge browser on Xbox One is going to look exactly like what you see on Windows 10. Yeah. Your navigation bar up at the top is exactly where you would expect it to be. Your settings, your favorites, your tabs, they're all right there. And uh, additionally, your cursor is going to kind of jump around uh, intuitively between interactive it's smart. elements. It knows where yes, to go, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, it also enables another really cool thing that's it's my favorite feature of the new Microsoft Edge browser is that you can now download and upload uh, videos and pictures oh. uh, directly to your console or to attached external storage. Right. So you could do something like download a photo from your favorite photography website mm -hmm. and then set that as your background, your custom background on Xbox One. Real quickly and easily. Yeah. That's exciting. I know a lot of people use Microsoft Edge on the console. I'm surprised, actually, that a lot of people do, but they like browsing, sitting back in their room and using the controller. So this is a great, great news for that. Now, I'm actually, we're really excited about this next one. We actually debuted this next feature last week to fans on the Xbox Insider Ring, but I want to touch on the new Share Controller feature on Mixer. That's, that's really exciting. Let's talk about that. Yeah, Share Controller is extremely cool. So what it basically does is it shares some of the attributes of the Copilot feature that we've had on Xbox One for yeah. a while, uh, but it's doing it through Mixer. So you're able to basically for all intents and purposes, virtually share your controller with one of your viewers. It's like you're handing them your controller and yeah. saying, all right, help me out in this game. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's kind of important to, to note that you're sharing control. They're not necessarily taking control. Right, right. So you're still going to have control on your end the entire time, but they basically have access to all the buttons on your controller except for the, uh, the guide button, that, yeah. that Xbox button. Of course. Them because it's a system level button. Now I tried this out and it's actually kind of cool. You it's exactly you go to you go into your console, you go to over to the uh, you go down a mixer, you start streaming and there's an option called share the controller. Again, this is on the insider ring only right now. Right. This will be going out to everyone later this year. Um, and exactly that, all of a sudden I'm ha ha virtually handing my controller through the screen to somebody out there on the internet. Could be a person, could be a dog. Yeah, I don't and, know. <laughs> and they could help you out, or they could do the opposite. They could not help you out. So anyway, <laughs> um, thank you for that. Now listen, this next moment I've really been excited about because Ronnie, this is you. <laughs> now I want to tell the story because you and I have known each other a long time, yes. and I have been over in your office going, Ronnie, I need this feature, and you're like, we're working on it, I'm working on it, I'm working on it. But it's it's really exciting. It's it's sharing to Twitter. Tell us yep. what we've had the feature, but you've yep. updated it, right? Yeah. Sure. So um, previously, you've always been able to share a screenshot or a game clip to your Twitter feed. Yeah. Um, and the way we were implementing it is that it would share a twi uh, it would share a link to your OneDrive. Uh, uh, yeah. Or, or a right yeah, to the console, right? Exactly, right, right, exactly, right to the content. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, d and depending on what platform you were viewing the content on, it would be hard to engage with it, and it wouldn't always show up in your feed. Yep. And so, as part of this change, we're now directly uploading the content to Twitter. Right. So it shows up directly on your feed and in your Twitter media library. Yeah, and it's also really cool um, because it automatically adds hashtags. Yes. Because we know what game you're playing. The system exactly. knows what game is in there, yep. and it will add those hashtags and away they go. Now, what we're going to do is we're gonna do this live right Let's now. Do it. This yes. is my console. Uh, I'm gonna sign in here, and I've already signed in. I'm gonna go over to a, a capture that I have from earlier, and I'm gonna go to recent captures, and you can actually go to my Twitter feed right now yes. at, at Major Nelson and see this. So this is a beautiful sunset video. So it does video and pictures. It does, yes, exactly, okay. game clip screenshots, yep. So I'm gonna click share, and I'm gonna go down to Twitter, and then here, he, this is exactly what you're talking about. You can yep. see it auto-populated. And we have a new hashtag, um, hashtag Xbox Share. So right. even if you want to go check out some cool content, just go search for that and you'll see tons yep. of great stuff. Now normally, now, normally I would go ahead and type in a pithy message <laughs> and try to be cute and I would have a, something incorrectly spelled. But in this case, I'm just going to go hit, I'm going to go ahead and, and share it. And it's actually, yep. go, it's actually uploading it right to Twitter. To your exactly. point, the media will show directly in line. So as you're scrolling on your phone, yeah. your computer, your tablet, you're going to see this great screenshot as a video 
right there. Exactly. So, Super easy. Yeah. So, that's great. Thank you, guys. Antel, Thank Ronnie, you. Jordan, great to see you guys. Bringing inside Xbox back to the fans has been a labor of love for us here, but it's really about what you think. Rikari, what's the community been saying about the show? Lots of things, lots of things, of course. I'm going to pick my favorite first. So this is Evil Rabbit 669 that uh, wants to call out the T-shirts. Now I'm going to give you guys a little bit of behind the scenes. Alex and I did not coordinate these outfits as uh -huh. we look. Matter of fact, I wanted her to besties, change and she revealed. Besties. besties was supposed to be Larry's line too. <laughs> yeah. But Evil Rabbit, I want to thank you for sending this in because we've got a Sea of, Thieves, sea of Thieves Xbox One controller for you. Now we talk about the behind the scenes. I'm just going to prove that this is live for everybody. This won't count for anything. But real quick, I had to pull up Larry's tweet from earlier. And Graham doesn't know this is up here, but just take a look at Graham's face real quick. And I'm going to get away from this. Can we zoom in on that? Um, uh, warning. Warning no, if you're at No, I'm not going to zoom in on it. This content may be disturbing. Look, he's, he's trying to figure out what's going on. But we're going to hide that real quick. Let's get back to the community bits. And while I'm taking pot shots that relegated us to the uh, kids' desk over here. The cool desk. Famous Larry presenting a fabulous Sea of Thieves controller. With those white gloves. Got to say, the white gloves the made white a gloves. comeback. And, They're making a comeback. And they made the show. Yeah. So this is for you, a, a CFC controller. We've actually got another one for you. So that's two down. Now we've got two more things to give out. So let's see. Let's, let's see. see. Where's what, the one I liked? Which one did you like? All of I, them. I like this one. All, All right. right. So <laughs> Matt Sepulveda, we appreciate you watching, tuning in. We're glad you're enjoying it. But I think we need to upgrade that controller as well. So you are going to get a Sea of Thieves Xbox One controller. And last but not least, we get to pick the best one, right? The absolute best one? What do you think? Because we've got a very special thing. I like this one. This that's, is pretty cute. You know what? You know what? Didn't bring my kid in, but I'm partial to you making it happen anyway, James. Thank you so much for being excited for the show. Alex, what is he going to get? He's going to get a Sea of Thieves bundle. Like, I'm talking so the, the whole Xbox console. One yes, the Xbox One S. That the is game. coming your way. I hope it makes the little one happy, though I doubt it's going to happen. But there we go. All good times Raising all around. Raising the next generation of gamers. Yeah, we're having fun. Now, our next golden mystery is just about to be revealed. But first, our friends from behind the Darwin Project just released a new look at this unique Battle Royale title with a twist. Let's go ahead and meet the director. Oh, hello there. I'm the show director. You know, as long as people have been fighting to death in the woods, crowds have gathered to watch. When Cain slew Abel, I was there. When Caesar got knife rushed, I was there. When Abe Lincoln got fragged, I was there. I'm the equalizer, the instigator, a game show host with nuclear weapons. You could be me. I mean, if you want. Gamers of the world, tell me what to do. Who is worthy? Vote now. While we're near the end of the show, don't stop with the comments on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Mixer, and more. Heck, we even read scrolls on there, don't we, Graham? That's right. Now, you, you have the scroll, but before we get started, I have something for you. Earlier in the show, you were reaching at the gold console. Yeah. So I went into my closet and got you your own set of gloves. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh. So you're all set. This now means you, so much to me. Now, Thank now you, you there so you much. There you go. You, you are now in oh, the Oh, that's club, fantastic. Uh, I'm going to put them in my back pocket. That's all right. Great. Uh, We've got a scroll I, I, here. I genuinely wasn't expecting that. This, so is, thank ex you. this is exciting. <laughs> yes. You were talking about social media. Yes. This is the traditional pirate social media. Yes. So cool. let's <laughs> roll this out. Can you turn that around to show people? Because there's just, just in, like you can in, in true see. Sea of Thieves style. Look, mm -hmm. there's a real riddle on and here. And we're going to read the riddle to you right now, live on the air. Many have fallen when greed takes hold for a bountiful booty of beautiful gold. Head to the crow's nest for a swipe sight quite absurd. Come weigh your anchor on 19th of the third. A sharp, savvy crew should be what you seek for the legendary treasure that here you can peek.
clue, I suggest you all go to get this xbox.com slash the banana quest for the next piece of the puzzle. Hmm. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. Stay tuned to Xbox Wire at news.xbox.com in the coming weeks to find out what we have in store for the next edition of Inside Xbox Snipper. Right, Graham? Yeah, that's right. And don't forget, don't Sea forget. of Thieves comes out March, March 20th. 20th. All right, bye-bye, everybody. Bye, Thanks everyone. for watching. See you later.